Mm -hmm. I call the, um, did the whole thing a really good job. May 9th school committee meeting to order. Um, order at 7.01. The clocks in this room are a little slow. Um, we do open this evening with the hearing on um, school choice. We have a quorum. I, we told them that it's seven o'clock. So I just, I want, I'm, we, we might as well just sort of get rolling and introduce the um, public hearing. Okay. Do you have to introduce the school choice? Yes, I do. Okay. So uh, under Massachusetts general law, school districts are automatically in the school choice program unless the school committee opts out of those, uh, opts out by June 1st of each year from that program. So it's an annual uh, vote that needs to be taken if the schools choose, uh, school department chooses to opt out. So um, what I've included in your packet is the latest projected enrollments for next year. Um, and you can you can see pretty much how it's broken down. Uh, as, as we've talked about before, grades K and one for next year are two very large grades. Um, and you can see by the numbers that our class sizes, for the most part, are are reaching, if not exceeding, some of the 20, um, 18 to 22 ranges. Um, at the middle school level, the way to look at it is at Coolidge, to calculate the class size, you divide each of the grades by six, and at Parker, you divide each of the grades by eight. That gives you the class sizes. And then at the high school, you really can't calculate the class sizes because it's done by each individual course. Um, and the availability of the sections. So based on our current enrollment, our current space that we have allocated <coughs> um, at each level, I would recommend to the school committee that you not participate in school choice for next year. Um, just a little bit more about the law. If, if you do choose to do school choice, you can choose uh, certain grades if you want. Um, we would need to publicize a certain amount of slots available for each grade. Um, we would then have to give a waiting period. Applications would come in. And then um, if the number of slots, students that apply equals the number of slots, then all of those students would come on Mackley. If it exceeds the number of slots available, we would do a random selection of lottery. You cannot, you cannot choose students any other way if your numbers exceed um, the number of slots that are available. Mm -hmm. oh, there is um, a financial piece to this for a school choice for each student that comes in. It's $5,000 for full day students, $2,500 for a half day student. Um, if a student is on an IEP that there is other funding available and there's a cost calculation that goes with that. <clears throat> and that's from the Sending Districts Chapter 70 money. Dr. I just the, um, it was, I know people need to understand that if we choose not to participate in school choice, does it mean that our students cannot choice out? No, they can go out. We do have a handful of students that go to other districts. It's a small number. Uh, we have a couple of students that are even in online groups that are considered school choice. And the only transfer is from the chapter 70 to 5,000. There's no additional per pupil, like if the district's per pupil is. Well, that is, that, that is your, that's your state right. funding. But that's all that transfers. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Transportation is not part of any school choice because that's not reimbursable. Oh, Dr. Is the, is the um, 
per pupil amount given to us the sending districts or our districts? No, we get we get five thousand dollars per five. student that would come. Our per pupil for next year is around thirteen thousand one hundred dollars, approximately. So we get five thousand. Yes. That right. It costs more to have them here, and if they're oh, may I ask another? Go ahead. If they're um, if they're diagnosed while here and it's decided they need an IEP, so they didn't come with an IEP, but it happens while they're here, how does that work in terms of funding? Does that same? We would be providing the educational services necessary for that student. So that act, that extra equation, the cost calculation you called it, does not kick in if the um, evaluation happens here? No, I do believe we do get some cost back, but it's not 100%. It, there's a certain formula that's used. For the Thank survey. you. And I think it's based on the services, and yes. I think that funding would be available not the year of, but a following year. It's like a circuit breaker. They, uh, they would the only reach a circuit breaker. The formula that they breaker. use yeah. is similar to the circuit breaker formula, is my understanding, for the reimbursement piece through school choice. And the other, once a student comes into the district, they stay in the Reading Public Schools until they graduate or they choose to leave. So, John, you mentioned something that I hadn't picked up on in the past, that we have students from Reading that, that go, go to other... Just do, a small number. Do we, do we, in the same vein, lose Chapter 70 money because they're going to another district? Yeah, it's just a small number. Okay. It's... it's literally under five students. There are not a lot of school choice districts in our area. Yeah. Um, there's some up in the uh, Cape Ann area. Um, there's some uh, more out in the central and western part and south shore. Yeah, and Gloucester, it's in that, those Gloucester, Manchester, that it's a very, there are a lot of students that move around. <clears throat> Mr. Weiss? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you guys can hear this thing's weird. Um, so I guess I was one of the ones who was asking about the whether our kids would be blocked by this decision, so I'm glad to hear that we're not. But the reason why I was asking that question is our policy, um, which is policy JFBB, which refers to MGL 7612. And MGL 7612 is attendance outside place of residence, which simply says any child with consent of the school committee of the town where he resides may attend at the expense of said town the public schools of another town upon such terms as may be fixed by two communities. That's the top of the school choice policy that says that, which is why I was asking that question. Um, so I, don't, I know we're not voting to bar that because we can't bar that. Um, but it seems like we're instead voting against MGL 76 12, section 12B instead of 12. Um, and maybe there's a minor update there that might help clear that communication. And in, predict in, predict uh, in particular, section D of that that statute. Um, so that's why I was asking that question offline, and I thank you for the clarification. Um, one other point of note is that in terms of schools relatively close to us, Burlington does have school choice for their high school in particular. Um, not that it impacts this vote, but there are schools relatively close to us that do, the, do offer the option. The motion, though, will be, um, is pursuant to um, Mass General Law 76 and 12B. It's 12B. So the motion that we yeah. haven't read the motion yet. It's it's 12B. So okay. It, we, it, there's, we need to put that on our list of policy. Policy so review questions, yep. Um, Dr. Ike, did you have anything else? No, that was it. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> yep. And can you read the motion? Yep. I move pursuant to the provisions of GLC 76 and 12B that the school committee of Reading following a public hearing, hereby withdraws from its obligation to enroll non-resident students in Reading Public Schools during the 2019-2020 school year for the following reason, general district enrollment. Second. Second. Mr. Robinson. Um, yep, we have, this is a public hearing, so if there are any other questions from the public. Oh, 
um, it, it, it would be on school choice, questions on specifically oh, on, on school, school choice. choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, the public hearing on our agenda, the public hearing is specifically for this item. There's no further. And we'll just, uh, call for the vote. All those in favor? And no, none opposed. So that's a 6 0 vote. Um, let me just, we're, I want to go through the agenda real briefly. Um, but also to start off, um, just reminding ourselves, and I have a little bit of um, a head cold, so um, I'm going to try talking to the mic. Uh, the, our mission of our Reading Public Schools District is to ensure that all students have common, challenging, meaningful learning experiences in the academics, health and wellness, the arts, community service, co-curricular activities, and athletics. We will lead and manage our school community to reflect the values and culture of the Reading community and guide and support our students to develop the appropriate skills, strategies, and knowledge necessary to be productive, informed, independent citizens in a global society. Um, oh, I'm like, okay, it's the 375. Sorry. I'm see a purple. I'm like, okay, I see a lot of guests. They all have purple on. What does this all mean? <laughs> Got it now. Um, okay, so we tonight we have our... Um, we will have a public comment for items not on the agenda. We'll go through our consent agenda. We have reports and we have um, a special report. So I'm going to have Mrs. Borowski do her um, report uh, first. She is our liaison to the um, 375 committee. We'll take other reports um, and then the um, administration reports and then move into our NEASC update vote on the last day of school and our opening of the superintendent's evaluation process. So I think that's how we'll proceed. If there's any um, public comment for items not on the agenda, I'll take those at the moment. Hi, Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. I am here today to ask that the, um, and that uh, pre-calculus course in the high school not be eliminated until curriculum maps for middle and high school are completed so that we know where all that missing where all that content will go whether some of it will be eliminated folded into earlier classes and if so which ones and I've asked this before I'll ask again I still um, don't understand why Reading uh, will not re consider restoring uh, access to algebra as early as seventh grade for the few students who are ready for that and need that challenge, and uh, in eighth grade for most, and uh, obviously some might need to be delayed till ninth grade, but um, if the majority of students are getting algebra in middle school, then we won't need to do any strange uh, things like eliminate the full year pre-calculus class. I had three kids go through that class. None of them was bored. There's a lot of content in there that's important for later. Um, so I would like to ask that you hold off on that, on making additional changes until you've fully documented what's in there now and where all that material would go. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Uh, Alex Becker, um, I had just a general question about the extended day program that is offered. Um, um, uh, we were applying for it for a kindergartner, um, we're waitlisted for it, and I, my understanding from sort of other sources is that something like 75% of the people who applied for it, which I assume goes from kindergarten to sixth grade or whatever it is, um, were accommodated and um, the rest are on waiting list and I, I guess my just general question was um, does this does the district have plans to um, expand the program um, sort of what what in general is um, the trajectory going forward because it seems like a lot of people um, in town had uh, issues getting uh, partial numbers of days of the week that they requested or were in prior years and then were not accommodated this year. Um, 
we're coming in at kindergarten and it seems like since there's priority given to continuing families <coughs> that it could be an issue going forward as well in, in, into subsequent years. So I just kind of had a, just a general question as to um, what the plans were for expanding the program if that's a possibility. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Um, Dr. Evans, can you make a brief comment on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to have Mrs. Kelly answer it. So, hi. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we have, uh, we had over 700 applicants. Uh, we currently have about 70 full-time spots at each building. Uh, the only school uh, that actually is continuing to register is Wood End. We have wait lists at all the other schools. Um, the way we've done it in the past, and our numbers have exploded this year and last year, um, so the answer is, you asked, are, we, are there plans to expand? And the answer is yes. We've already expanded and we want to expand. It's really a question of staffing. Uh, with the economy being so well, we're advertising on Monster. We're, we're not just hiring anyone with the pulse. Uh, we want to get really good people in. So we're hoping to attack that wait list as much as we can. Um, as far as how we, we've done in the registration in the past, we have done what we called a priority registration um, that included kindergarten as, as a, in that. So otherwise, kindergarten people would never get in because if everyone in it just applied every year, we would never, ever open a spot. We don't even have all the room for, you know, we've had people who've been in the program three and four years and didn't get everything they wanted. So um, we definitely <coughs> have a very long wait list and we're really working hard. We're interviewing currently. We're doing um, a few new things, looking at ratios, looking at what other districts are doing as far as student ratios. Our kindergarten and first grade ratios have to be a little lower than the other grades, so we're actually looking at splitting the program into two sections. We're also looking at under, outside vendors that come with their own staffing, so that on certain days, especially Wednesdays, we might be able to accommodate more. All I can tell you is, um, in the last couple of weeks, myself and, and the extended day staff, we fielded dozens and, and probably closer to 100 emails and phone calls. People are concerned about this. Um, we provide before and after school care in the Reading schools as a service to the community. It is not something that we have to do. We do it because we know it's good for kids. And we run a really quality program, which is why it's so popular. Um, every, every extended program um, in, the, in the town it has a wait list currently. So this is not a new concept. We're all struggling for staffing. And we're actually talking with the Y about sharing staffing and looking at days and things like that. So all I can tell you is hold tight. We're doing our best. I know you're probably on wait lists multiple places. Um, we're all in the same boat. We're working really hard. <coughs> right now, a good economy is not our friend. Um, and we've looked at, you know, what we pay people. We're within industry standards, all of that. Um, when Sandy, um, who is not here tonight, our director, came on board, what was it, like 170? Yeah, it was and, and, you know, we're just, we're up. Uh, we have currently 70 spots at every school. We would love to, uh, my goal is to have no wait list. So as far as registration, how we do that, we definitely have grown too big to do walk-in registration. So we're looking at options for next year um, <coughs> that it probably include an online kind of thing. But the bottom line is, no matter how we do the registration, we don't have enough spots. Mm -hmm. So all I can tell you is that if I could get qualified people, we, you know, there's a rumor out that we're not looking to expand staff. That's not true. If you know anyone looking to work before or after school, we don't typically hire a lot of kids and we don't count them in our staffing numbers. So the high school kids that do work for us answer doors, they answer phones, they do other things, and they support our staff, but unlike some other programs, we don't hire a, a huge cache. We try to look for people who are um, college age and above, preferably with education backgrounds. Um, so we have quality staff, which is why our program is so popular. But we're doing our best. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to um, the consent agenda, actually. So, can I get a motion? Sorry. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Wise. You beat me to it. Hi. All those in favor? And that's 6 0. Excellent. Okay, so now we're moving on to report. So, Mara, I'm going to have Mrs. Borowski go first because I think um, <laughs> you'll certainly be very interested in this, and then we'll go back <coughs> to you and work our way around. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to express my gratitude to the chair. I reached out to Ms. Webb a couple of days ago. Um, the Reading 375 Steering Committee 
almost all of whom, maybe all of whom, I think, are here tonight, um, along with several volunteers who are working on different events, um, reached out to the select board, and they were really open to getting an update on all of the events that are happening over the two-week celebration of our town's 375th anniversary. Um, it was very well received. So I reached out to Mrs. Webb and said, this really impacts the school community. So many of these events are family friendly. Um, and she completely agreed, so has given me permission to give a lengthier report than normal. So um, as you all know, Writing 375 is the 375th celebration of our 375th anniversary as a town. Uh, it's a two-week celebration. It happens from May 31st to June 15th, and you will find at your at your spots a slate of events. And I'm going to briefly go through each one just to give you a sense of just how broad this celebration is and just how many people are involved in it. So I'll start by saying that we're joined tonight by Phil Rushworth, who is the chair of Writing 375, and on <coughs> steering committee members Katie <coughs> Robertson, um, Sarah Brookalito, um, Alan Folds, Ace Folds. And Amanda Folds. They've been at work for more than a year putting this together. So the party kicks off on Friday, May 31st. That is opening ceremonies. It's 7 p.m. on the Common. It will include a Jumbotron. There will be a Jumbotron on the Common, and there will be an original video um, highlighting Reading's history. There will be images of Reading's past going back as far back as we have images to write through the present day. Um, and it'll be on a jumbotron, so it'll be visible from all areas of the common. There will also be live music, and the trees will be lit. There will be an illumination, a tree lighting ceremony, um, and the trees will stay lit for the two-week period. Awesome. Um, so as you're driving through town in the evening, you're going to know something special is going on because the, the common will be all lit up. Um, after that ceremony, which is relatively brief, the entire downtown is opening its doors. We've had a tremendous response from local organizations, local churches, and local businesses who want to participate in opening ceremonies. Um, these venues will be marked by purple balloons. There'll also be a list available on the website, so you can go to the website and see what um, businesses, churches, and organizations are participating. Um, the list is actually quite long and growing every day, so I can't go through all of them, but to give you a flavor, we have one venue doing a Make Your Own Sunday Bar, we have one venue hosting a wine tasting, and several of our local restaurants are offering discounts and specials to anyone wearing a Reading 375 pin or a Reading 375 t-shirt. Um, since I'm talking about it, these pins are $3.75. They're available at Whiteland Books, the town clerk's office, RCTV Studios, Reading Cooperative Bank, that's it. Um, the t-shirts are $20. They are commemorative. They're limited edition. You can keep them forever to remember this special occasion. Um, those are available at Reading Trophy and Shirt and RCTV Studios as well. So anyway, if you're wearing this gear, you go around town, a lot of our restaurants are offering discounts and specials, so you can have a bite to eat, there's going to be entertainment, um, there's just going to be a ton going on in the downtown area. Um, James Bonazzoli, Paula Perry, and Sheila Mulroy have been the spearheads of this. They have done the work to make this happen. It's a tremendous amount of logistical work, so we're grateful to them. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Adams um, has been knee-deep in the library archive helping to put together that video of Reading's history that will be up on the Jumbotron that evening. The following day, Saturday, June 1st, we give you the morning off to sleep because you're going to be tired from the night before. Um, that afternoon at 3 p.m., right here in the Reading Memorial High School um, Forming Arts Center, there's going to be a concert for Reading. This is a free concert, but a ticket is required. You can pick up your tickets at RCTV Studios. Um, so it's free, but you do need a ticket to enter. This concert is going to feature the Reading Community Singers under the direction of Beth Mosier and the Reading Symphony Orchestra under the direction of George Ogata. Bob Beckman and Marlene Wolf, who I believe is here tonight, have been instrumental in doing all the logistical works to pull a concert of this scope together. And I'm delighted to say that the entire production is being produced by William Enslow, who I believe is here tonight as well. Oh, nice um, to see you. And I'm sure everyone in this room knows that you passed his name tonight. As you walk into our Performing Arts Center, it's named after him. So to have our concert produced by William Enslow is, is tremendously exciting. It's going to be a beautiful afternoon of music, celebration, and community. Over the two-week period, there's going to be an event called Paint the Town. It happens for the full two weeks. Um, I think I've shared, I have shared with this committee before. Local artists were invited to submit an original work of art inspired by our community. I'm delighted to share with you that we have more than 30 original works of art created by local artists inspired by our town. They're going to be displayed at venues all around the community. Again, go to the website, you'll get a list of where the art is, what the art is, and who the artist is. Um, <coughs> so it's a real celebration of the talent that exists in our town. There will be a reception um, for Paint the Town 
On Wednesday, June 5th at 6 p.m., Jane Burns and Eileen Barrett have been the spearheads of that. And again, just if you think about the marketing to get artists to participate, scheduling all that, it was an enormous undertaking and it, um, it's been very successful. The response has been great. So I think we're all excited to see this artwork. Um, on Saturday, June 8th, that is sort of the midpoint of the celebration and there is stuff morning till night. So you're gonna wanna just clear that day. Um, it kicks off at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Reading Public Library with an event called Our Town, Your Story. It's at the Reading Public Library from 10 to 1, and here's how it works. You bring up to three photos of your Reading experience. It could be your home, it could be your family, it could be for um, people in the community who go back a generation or two, it could be historic photos of Reading, um, whatever is meaningful to you. Up to three photos, you bring them to the library, they're gonna be scanned into the virtual collection, and you'll have the opportunity, if you want, to make a short video explaining why these photos are meaningful to you. The idea behind this is to create a legacy. We're celebrating Reading 375, but we know that there'll be a future generation celebrating Reading 400, Reading 450, and these images will exist. You can look and see what life was like in Reading in 2019 and what mattered to the people who lived here. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity for each one of us to be part of Reading's history. <coughs> Um, the entire library staff, particularly Amy Lannan, the director, has been huge in making this event happen. So we're delighted to have the partnership of the Reading Public Library. On the afternoon of Saturday, June 8th, we're having one of our signature events. This is something I think we're all very excited about. It's called Porch Fest. I know I've updated the committee on this one already. I have a little bit more of an update on it tonight. Um, Porch Fest is done in other communities. So a lot of our neighboring communities do this annually. We've never done it in Reading, so as part of the 375th, we decided we, were, we will do Porch Fest for the very first time. Um, it's a completely free event to the public. You can walk all around town and you will hear live music on front porches, front lawns, and driveways all over Reading on the afternoon of Saturday, June 8th. Um, I am delighted to share with you that we have had more than 30 bands signed up. Yeah, it's an enormous response for a community that's never done it before. It's, it's tremendous, the response we've had. And what's really exciting is this huge variety of genre of music. There's bluegrass, there's banjos, there's punk, there's rock, um, there's much more. There's all different kinds. Um, so you can just stroll around town and just listen to the music and see what you find. You can also go to the website and see what bands are playing at what locations if you want to plan out your day a little bit more. Um, but the response to that has been really exciting. Alan Ace and Amanda Folds are really the people who brought this to Reading. And again, I've said it, but the amount of work that that took, it's really something special. Over that weekend, from Friday to Saturday, June 7th and 8th, Parker Tavern is throwing open its doors. And um, I'm, I'm very excited because it's the oldest structure and building. It is, it is, if you want to talk about writing history, Parker Tavern is where you get the oldest history in our town. Um, and so on Friday, June 7th, you can attend Tavern at the Tavern. There will be period music and libations. So if you want to experience what entertainment um, and, and, and refreshment would have been like hundreds of years ago, you can do that at the location of our oldest building. So that's called Tavern at the Tavern. Um, on Saturday, June 8th, I am particularly excited about this one. At Washington Park, you can attend a vintage baseball game. Mm -hmm. We will be fielding a couple teams that will be wearing the uniforms and using the equipment that would have been typical in the 1800s. So if you're interested in baseball, if you're interested in history, this is an opportunity to literally step into history and witness a baseball game the way it would have been played more than 100 years ago. Uh, so that's just a tremendous opportunity. If during that event you find yourself a little hungry or thirsty, you can head over to Parker Tavern where they're hosting Clubhouse at the Tavern and they'll be providing baseball themed refreshments. Um, that evening, uh, again, at the location of Parker Tavern, they will be hosting revelry at the Tavern, cocktails, music, entertainment, and just a fun night together um, to celebrate our town and our history. Stephanie Johnson, Kathy Crook, uh, and Diane Wilson. I know Stephanie is here. <laughs> uh, and Kathy, Kathy, um, are here, and friends of Parker Tavern, obviously, again, an enormous amount of work to pull that all together and make it happen, but it seems important if we're gonna celebrate our history to honor Parker Tavern. Um, so there's a lot of events happening in that location that weekend. On Monday, June 10th, that is Charter Day, that is the literal birthday of Reading. We're still working on the details on that, so you're gonna wanna check the website for it. The one thing we are very, very clear on is there will be birthday cake. So <laughs> Reading will have birthday cake on Monday, June 10th. Um, on Wednesday, June 12th, 
Uh, the Reading Rotary's annual Taste of Metro North is happening that evening. We're particularly grateful for the partnership with Reading Rotary. They typically host this event earlier in the year. And they, we worked together and agreed that it would be a phenomenal part of Reading 375. So the Rotary moved this event to be part of the two-week celebration. So it's that midweek period. It's Wednesday night. You can buy a ticket. It's at the field house. There is food provided by all our local um, restaurants. It's just it's a fun night out and a great celebration of our restaurant community and good food. Um, that brings me to Saturday, June 15th. That's the last day of the celebration. <coughs> Um, truly, on Saturday the 15th, it's morning till night. It starts in the morning at the high school track with the Friends of Reading Recreation Kids Fun Run. After that, from 10.30 to 3, the Reading Lions Club hosts their annual Friends and Family Day at the Birch Meadow Fields. Um, I know you all go to that every year. We always, as a committee, have a presence there. But they are expecting this year to have their biggest event yet. Um, there's going to be food, games, giveaways, entertainment. Um, it's just going to be such a fun way for the community to come together and celebrate on the 15th. Um, so we're really grateful for the Lions Club and their partnership, and we've been working with, um, just to, to recognize them, Sharon Thomas, Lorraine Berry, Joanna Crowley, and Joe Thomas from the Lions Club have really been partnering with us um, on it. That afternoon, um, thanks to Remax Encore and Karen Herrick was the local resident who partnered with us on this. Um, we will have the Remax Encore hot air balloon on the Birch Meadow field. Weather permitting, so weather permitting, it will be offering tethered rides to residents. So you can actually get a bit of a bird's eye view of Reading. So that's a really unique and special and fun thing for folks to do. Also that afternoon at 2.30 in the afternoon at Wood End School, is the Reading 375 Dog Parade. We've never done anything like this in town. It will be the biggest gathering of canines in Reading history. Um, Reading <coughs> registration is required for this event because we need to make sure your dog is licensed and has had its rabies vaccination. So you register on the website, reading375.com, um, and your dog can be part of, part of history, part of the town. Um, Marcel Dubois has been spearheading that, that effort. Um, that late afternoon, there will be a concert back at Birch Meadow featuring the Reading Community Concert Band and the North Shoreman Barbershop Chorus. There will be food trucks, a big variety of different food trucks, so you can have your meal, um, your evening meal there, and everyone in the family can pick what they want to eat. Um, Kathy Spur actually headed up this, the food truck event, organized it all, got them all lined up, so we're really grateful to her. And the Reading 375 two-week ceremony, a celebration, and it's the only way it could, fireworks fireworks. So we're going to have huge big fireworks to end the, the two-week celebration. Um, I do want to make you aware, in addition to those events, most of which are happening on individual nights, there's a few things happening throughout the week. One of them is an event called If This House Could Talk. The idea behind this is every home and business in Reading has a story. There's something about your house that is special to you that maybe your neighbors don't know. It could be a renovation that you've done recently. Um, it could be something that's architecturally interesting. It could be something about the people who lived there before you. It can really be whatever's special about your house. Um, the way this works is we provide you with a custom lawn sign. You type up three to five sentences. This is special about my house. This is why I love my house. This is a fun fact about my house. You put the lawn sign in your front yard on May 31st. You keep it there through June 15th. And that way, as residents are enjoying Porch Fest and enjoying the Art Walk and out and about in the community, you're going to see these signs. And they're all they're custom, so they all look the same. And you pause, and you'll learn the stories of your neighbors' homes and business buildings. And um, it's just a way to share our stories and kind of share our community, bring us together. Um, this has been done in other communities. Sarah Bricolacchio and Diane Wilson are the folks who brought this to, um, to Reading 375. And I am very happy. We have more than 50 homes and businesses already signed up with a sign. So there's going to be a nice big presence and um, more coming in every day. A couple more. <laughs> um, we have a brand new book that has been published, or it's, well, it's going to be released on Monday, so we're almost at the release date to the public. Um, it's called Images of America Reading. It's a book based on writing history. Um, it goes on sale beginning Monday, and you can meet the authors who are longtime Reading residents, get your own copy um, on Monday night, May 13th, at RCTV Studios. So it's this coming Monday. Um, and I'm delighted that I think just one of the authors is here tonight. Everett Blodgett is here. Um, he and his wife, Jenny, wrote this book. It took them more than a year of, to put together. So um, 
it's an amazing thing to have. It's an amazing commemoration of this ceremony, of this celebration. It's also, it's a phenomenal gift for anyone who cares about writing. It's a very special, special book. So I encourage you to check that out. Last one. Um, and it, so all of these events are happening over the two-week period. There's food, there's fireworks, there's concerts, there's artwork, there's community events, there's so much going on. Um, there will be an online scavenger hunt that any Reading resident can participate in. It's app-based. You download the app. You could actually do that today. The information is on the Reading 375 website. However, the game doesn't start till May 31st, so you can't cheat. You can't like look and see what the clues are. On May 31st, the game starts. You look at your app, and it will give you challenges. Go to this Reading 375 event. Take a, f a photo in front of this iconic writing location. Um, so you and your family can earn points by participating in this online scavenger hunt. Um, this app is being sponsored by the Reading Cooperative Bank, and particularly Crystal Hodson from Reading Co-op has done all the work to make the app work, the technological work, to get it up and running. It's a fantastic way for families, particularly, I think, or to participate in this. It's a little competitive. It's really fun. Um, it keeps you focused on the two-week event. Um, also, thanks to the Reading Cooperative Bank, we will have $1,500 in prizes awarded. There will be a prize for first place and second place winners. Um, but there's also prizes for best demonstration of writing pride, best family photo, best in show dog photo. So there's some really fun creative prizes that you can earn as well. So that's a really fun way to enjoy the celebration. Uh, Laura Wilson, who's a local resident, has signed on to be our volunteer coordinator. We're very grateful to her. Running all of these events over two weeks is going to be an enormous undertaking, and we've had several hundred Reading residents volunteer through the website to say, I will be a volunteer at Reading 375. She's going to be the person who helps corral all those folks to make this all go off without a hitch, so we're really grateful to her. Um, the only thing I want to add is that the town hall, the police department, and Dr. Doherty and Ms. Engelson have been enormously helpful in helping us utilize school, town, and police social media and email to get the word out. So it's been really helpful. That's the challenge, is to make sure everyone in town knows this is happening. Um, so that's what's happening, and now this is what I'm going to ask my colleagues on the school committee. We really need all of your help as elected officials getting the word out about Reading 375. So some ideas include, um, could you send an email to everyone you know in Reading? It would take two minutes. Just an email that says, I'm looking forward to our town's 375th anniversary celebration. See all the events at this website, Reading375.com. It could be two sentences. But if you each email everyone you know in town, it just raises that awareness and the excitement about it. Um, we're doing a lot on social media. Uh, I've already done this, so I encourage you to throw on a t-shirt, throw on your pin, take a selfie, or have someone take a photo of you and put it up on social media. Um, just celebrate the awareness and your enthusiasm about Reading 375. Most importantly, we really want you to attend all the events that you can. It's a lot. <laughs> but um, we really do hope to see everybody there. And if you are there, uh, again, post to social media with the hashtag Reading 375 so we can see that you're out enjoying, um, enjoying the hard work that so many people have done. So, and I'm so delighted to have so many folks here tonight to, to spread the enthusiasm and the pride. Thank you, Jean. Really Thank um, you, Jean. appreciate everyone being here this evening. Probably something Ms. Sporowski didn't know is that Mr. Blodgett used to teach here. I think I did know that. Um, <laughs> I said we something Ms. Sporowski didn't know is that Mr. Blodgett used to teach here. Mm. It, was a lot, it was quite a while ago. <laughs> A little longer than when Mr. Enslow was here. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, he was uh, the, the local historian then, or keeper of history then as well. So um, really appreciate everyone coming tonight um, and donning all your purple. Mm -hmm. um, it is going to be a great celebration, and I'm sure that all of us will do everything we can to get that word out and uh, participate. And um, of course, we'll be there on the 15th. Um, so, and the website is just, is it writing375.com right writing there? Writing375.com. Info is the email. And everything is there. Every event, the date, the time, the location, if it's like the, the app, what the rules are. Like, everything's on the website. Great, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. You guys don't have to stay for the rest yeah. of the meeting. <laughs> but you can. Thank you for your work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let's go back to reports and we'll start with Mara.
Okay. Tough back to fall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's been a lot of extracurricular and academic activities recently at the high school. So in terms of extracurricular activities, this week we have a chorus concert coming up. So the RMHS Chorus Department is hosting its annual Spring Into Song concert on May 18th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Kristen Killian is retiring after 35 years of teaching music here in Reading. So be sure to attend and support both her contributions to Reading and the hard work of students. So admissions free. That will be next week. Also, um, we have the band concert, which is actually happening right at this very moment at the um, auditorium. So the RMHS stage, jazz, and symphonic bands are hosting their annual spring concert right now. So all of their hard work, they've been working for months on their different music and have been really anticipating this event. Also, we just came out of a successful drama performance. The RMHS Drama Club just finished a run of the show Don't Touch That Dial, which centered around 1930s radio shows and radio dramas such as The Adventures of Superman and War of the Worlds. And then in terms of sports, spring sports are full in swing despite the poor weather. Today, the boys and girls tennis, boys lacrosse, and softball teams all played in games. And then also, there's been a lot of academic activity going on. So just last week, Holocaust survivor Irving Roth visited the high school on April 24th. Students from the Facing History and Ourselves class, along with various English classes, were able to listen to his life story, which was very moving and inspirational. Also, academically, AP testing has begun this week and will continue next week. Students have been busying study for exams. Additionally, MCAS is coming up as well, um, as well with the math test for sophomores at the end of May and the biology MCAS for freshmen at the beginning of June. And then lastly, with only five days left until the last day of school, anticipation has been building in the high school for seniors. The countdown tradition in the, um, in the hallways where seniors make posters for each day left of school is well in swing. Senior prom and senior award night are only a few weeks, of, weeks away. So everyone's really excited to move on and have fun with those senior events. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah. I don't think Mr. Wise, do you have any reports? No. Mm, I think you do. Can I get there? Yes. We'll get there. Yep. Mr. Robinson. Just a brief report on uh, the Recreation Committee. I'm looking for my notes. We met uh, last week. Oh, sorry. We met last week in the uh, main topic of discussion was uh, the we had a presentation from Reading Little League uh, their president to uh, situate portable bathrooms at at all the Little League fields they they had done a parent survey last year and that was a big big issue and they've gone through all the process uh, with the town and after they presented to us, they were going into the Board of Selectmen. I'm not sure how that made out, but uh, I think it passed, yeah. So uh, that was the main thing. And the other thing is the committee is down some members. Uh, so if you know anyone that's interested, they should, should put in uh, an application to town. And there's a lot of important things like the Birch Meadow Project and things that we're going to be discussing. Nope. Mr. Parks, nothing, and um, I think that HRAC is meeting in two weeks, so we haven't met, so I have no support there. Um, Dr. Gardy, you and your staff. I, I just want to report that we had uh, 42 Olympians participate in the Special Olympics today in Malden from Reading. We were the second largest school district there, just behind Malden. Wow. Um, Mrs. Hurley, who's one of our teachers and also a resident in town, spearheaded it, coordinated it, um, really needed the help of dozens of other staff members, parents' help, volunteers, and it was just tremendous. The children were so excited to be part of this event and really enjoyed it. So I want to thank Mrs. Hurley and everybody that contributed behind the scenes to make sure this happened. Um, and I'm just, I'm so proud of Reading for participating in that. It's optional, it's a choice, and it takes a tremendous amount of work, but it's such a uh, rewarding experience. And Mrs. Hurley let me know, I think that years ago when they first went, there were only three children. Mm -hmm. So 
It's just really out of Reading. It's just really grown so much. Um, and is that all ages? Yes, okay. school age. And uh, is it usually at Malden or was it? Is Malden's been the host community for a number of years. Yeah. So I, I saw something on Twitter where when they the students came back, they had a a. Uh, Police, police escort, police yeah. escort in the line. Yeah. Oh, it's, awesome. uh, they actually, nice. I was fortunate enough to be at Wood End today when they came back and they had all of the students lining Lined the up, entrance yeah. way. So all the schools did a well. It was, you definitely needed tissues and uh, it, it was very, it was very emotional. Parents were there, students were there, police escort. Mm -hmm. They did a really nice job. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, that's just that's that's the stuff that's. It takes a lot of extra effort sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not the kind of thing that's easy to justify up front because it's hard to quantify that value. But that value, that's because the value is nearly immeasurable. Mm -hmm. Correct. You don't yep. know, and you really don't know um, how impactful that is to individual student, but also to the students who, who support it, right? To, to the whole student body. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah. And um, Dr. Styes, Jennifer Styes has earned her doctorate, and she is now Dr. Styes. Oh, excellent. And she has begun her transition. She spent two full days here at the end of April and several partial days. So she's uh, meeting with folks, gathering all sorts of information, and is just uh, remains very excited about joining the community. And that's all I have for an update. Anything else, Dr. Doherty, or are we agenda? We've got agenda items. I've got plenty to say later. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so then we can start our uh, first agenda item is the NEASC and the late start. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for hosting my visit. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kate Boynton. I am the principal of Reading Memorial High School, and I'm happy to share with you tonight uh, executive summary of our uh, RMHS NEASC self-study. So just a little bit of an overview. So NEASC stands for the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. It's our accrediting organization. They adopted new standards, and this is really following several, many schools pulling out from the NEASC process um, several years ago, uh, working with superintendents to get feedback about the process to improve it so that it, it is more, um, more valuable and meaningful for schools. Um, so we are now in and part of the new standards. Um, the new standards and new accredi accreditation process uh, has a name for it. It's a vision for learning, and you'll see the terminology vision kind of appear throughout. Uh, we are really what I would like to call in the second cohort of schools. We have a number of schools in um, uh, signing on to the 2020 standards that um, are about six months to a year ahead of us and then some schools <coughs> behind, sort of depending when, um, you know, when they signed on. So we're in that second cohort of schools uh, to undergo the self-study process using the new standards. Uh, the self-study took place uh, for a year and a half or so from 2016 to 2018. It concluded in the fall of 2018 with the self-study report. And then we had what NEASC calls a collaborative conference visit. And it is a true collaboration. So the NEASC team will come and they meet and talk and collaborate with uh, members of the school community. That was in November of 2018, so last, uh, last fall. Um, I did present uh, the self-study findings to the school committee in the fall when that report was released. Um, following the collaborative conference, the NEASC team takes all of the information, so there are surveys that were done, uh, documents that are collected, the self-study report, and then the site visit um, notes and all of that. They take that and they compile uh, a, a report, and it took until uh, end of January, really, to, to have the report published to us. Um, the, uh, several priority areas were identified, I'll talk about those in a little bit, by the self-study process as well as the NEASC team. So our charge um, in the self-study is to really take a deep dive self-reflection in how we're doing as a school compared to the standards that NEASC outlines and identify areas that we feel that we're not, you know, we're not performing as well as we should and those become our priority areas for our work moving forward. Uh, our decennial visit, what is called the decennial visit, is scheduled for December of 2020, and really it's a 10-year process that NIAS kind of outlines. So that will give us our, um, our accreditation, if you will, and then 
and another 10 years, we'll have another decennial visit. So that's the overview. The 2020 learning standards, there are five of them. Uh, first one is learning culture, and that um, within learning culture, and they're fully articulated. If you have the, the packet, they're, much, they're fully articulated and elaborated. But in a nutshell, learning culture promotes shared values and responsibility for achieving the school's vision, and that includes all stakeholders. So really looking at collaboration amongst staff, uh, staff to community, students, um, you name it. It's full collaboration for achieving the school's vision. Standard two, student learning. Um, we have learning practices that maximize the impact of learning for each and every student. So really teaching all students is standard two. Standard three looks a little more closely at, at teacher professional practices and structures that support and, um, and improve student learning. So teacher collaboration is in there, uh, along with tiered instruction, tiered intervention. Um, so structures and practices that support student learning is, falls under standard three. Standard four is learning support. Um, these are additional, more school-wide systems um, and support to, uh, to, to support student learning and well-being. Follow, um, falling under this as well uh, is health and wellness uh, in this category. So um, adequate social workers, guidance department, health department, um, uh, school nurses falls under learning support. And then learning resources is all about um, the physical plant and um, budgetary <coughs> items that support the needs of all students. Um, and if you see, the student is really at the center of the NEASC process. Uh, so that, and in all aspects, uh, the student is at the center and all of the resources, the personnel, the vision, the collaboration to support student learning in all its facets. So that's that. Some major themes, and this is new terminology that I think is really important to understand in the new NEASC process. There are three sort of major themes, uh, supporting a culture of learning that encourages a look at the school environment, instruction, and curriculum from a learner's perspective. NEASC is emphasizing a growth mindset, a school's capacity as a learning organization, and reinforcing the idea that schools have room to grow and improve. So it's not, we're penalizing you for not, you know, meeting this standard, we want to work with you to help you grow to improve your, um, your fulfillment of a particular standard. So going a growth mindset, and that trickles down into staff and the community having a growth mindset about students as learners. And then a vision of the graduate, and this is a completely brand new idea for NEASC. I'm particularly excited about this, and I'll explain a little bit later, but it's a holistic view of expectations for students. It's transferable skills, content, understandings, dispositions. Who do we want our Reading students to be when they graduate from Reading Memorial High School after having gone through Reading Public Schools? Uh, so the vision of the graduate really kind of ties everything together. Um, and it is, it's the, the why, that why we're here, the vision of the graduate. Um, how they, the terminology that they use to, um, to identify what the expectations are, the first is a principle of a effective practice, which defines the expectation for a particular standard. Drilling down a little more deeply, the descriptors describe what those look like in practice, in the classroom, uh, in the hallways, uh, what leadership looks like, and then the foundational elements are essential building blocks, and these are your must-haves. We must have and demonstrate that we have these foundational elements um, in order to get accreditation. And then, of course, we want more than that, but the foundational elements, they really set, as they um, are named, the foundation for everything that the school is built on. Okay, so that's so just some of the new terminology uh, from the, the 2020 standards. I want to start with the commendations. And uh, they don't elaborate on them. Um, we, we are doing these really well. So this is just a summary of the page or two fully laid out um, commendations that the, the, NEASC self, uh, the, the NEASC Collaborative Conference team came and saw. They saw a safe and inclusive school. They saw a diversity of experiences for our students, both in the classroom and extracurricularly. Uh, they saw our core values identified um, and students knew the core values and they saw evidence of the core values in classrooms. They saw outreach to multiple different stakeholders. They absolutely saw a sense of pride in Reading and in Reading Memorial High School. They witnessed inquiry problem solving and a variety of assessments in our, our, assessments in our classroom. 
authentic learning experiences, and a very supportive community. They witnessed and heard about family and community partnerships, collaboration uh, amongst teachers and um, sort of between the school community and the town. Um, they uh, commend us on the level collapse, which they, they felt was a brave move, uh, and they do support uh, having a range of learners in a classroom. Um, that is philosophically a belief that NIASC uh, as an organization has. Uh, so they applaud us for taking on that hard work, knowing that, it, that, that it's, a, a, you know, it's a challenge and that we're working towards making that better in classroom um, experiences. Uh, they applaud us in our beginning use of data and encourage us to continue with that. Uh, to improve our practice. Um, they uh, commend us on our intervention strategies and tiered supports. Uh, prior to, um, or they arrived when we were in the planning stages for one new support that was introduced uh, this March, which are, is our Stepping Stone program, which supports students coming in from um, hospitalizations and long-term absences. So that was one thing that they applauded us on the intervention strategies, and we're very pleased to, to know that we, we were planning that particular program and support. Uh, they applauded us on our ac on access to health supports and counseling for our students. We have a safe and very well-maintained school site. They were very impressed with the building and the facilities. They really were. It was, um, they couldn't say enough about just how beautiful the school was and how well-maintained it was, and our crisis protocols. So that's just a, a, a quick summary. There's more in there of the commendations. <clears throat> So here is, uh, and this is taken directly from, uh, directly from the report, so the foundational elements. There are two in learning culture, one in student learning, one in professional practice, one learning support, and one learning resources. So six foundational elements all together. And if you notice, we meet the four out of the six. You can see the foundational element how we rated ourselves in the middle column, and then in the right <coughs> column, the visitors rating, which is the NEASC team. Uh, and what I really like about this, I don't like that we didn't meet all of the standards, the foundational elements, but what I do like is that our rating matches NEASC's rating, and that is critically important. If we had rated ourselves as meets the standard and they rated us as not met, that's not, you know, that's not good. Um, it's not showing that we are truly being reflective of what, it, what is happening and how we are doing uh, in our practice and, and with our students. Um, so we, we do not meet those standards, uh, and those, as you will see in the next slide, those foundational elements do become priority areas. Okay. So here we are with the priority areas, and we have, we have four of these. So these are areas that NIASC, along with us for the to, um, on the left-hand side really want us to work on prior to the decennial visit, and they would like us to um, demonstrate significant improvement and, in fact, meet the benchmark for those priority areas. So the first foundation element, 1.2a, it's the, a written document describing core values, beliefs about learning, and vision of the graduate. It really is about the vision of the graduate. So who do we want our student to be when they leave the doors of Reading Memorial High School, when they, you know, as, as a graduate of, of Reading, who do we want them to be? What skills do we want them to have? What dispositions? Uh, what values? Who do we want the, our, our young people to be? And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about next steps. Foundational element 2.2a is all about the written curriculum. It is those curriculum guides that our um, departments have been hard at work on all year that's been a um, building-wide priority. It, it's a professional practice goal for every single department, uh, and they are in um, really quite good shape at this point. They're in, in draft form, and the goal is to have the curriculum guides published uh, and for, for public view by the end of the school year, and we're well underway with that. So those are the two foundational elements that we also identified as areas of need, and NIASC agreed. There were several other uh, priority areas, and you'll see in the report that <laughs> NIASC didn't agree with those. So I, I didn't include those. Uh, it was things like budgetary stuff. It was the physical plant. NIASC took a look and said, you know what? You can pay attention to these. You know, don't ignore them. But w we don't agree. These don't rise to the level of priority area. Um, we're going to identify some other things. And what they did was identify the two on the right-hand side, standard one, principle one, and standard two, principle four. Um, the first, building a positive and respectful school culture. 
Okay, if you remember, back in November, that was at the height of the graffiti um, that was happening here at the high school. And it was front and center on the minds of kids, um, still is. Front and center on the minds of adults, still is. And so that is something um, we want to make sure that we are working to build a positive, respectful, equitable, and welcoming school culture for students and for staff. They also mentioned um, the the staff to staff relationships that you know we've been through um, a number of tough years and staff relationships internally uh, still need some work and they want us to recognize that um, they uh, absolutely applaud us and the staff whom they met with for identifying that as a need. Um, they want to make sure that we are you know that we're keeping that on our radar and that we are working to actively improve the positive and respectful school culture for students and adults alike. Standard two, principle four, um, is a little more about instructional practices. This goes to the level collapse and working on differentiation. Uh, and that is something that we have been working on as well here um, in professional practice. So they want us to um, know that we are already working on it, and they want that to, to keep as a priority area to make sure that we continue to work on differentiation and meeting the needs of all learners in all classrooms. Recommendations. So the recommendations, one way to, to understand the recommendations are things for us to think about that don't rise to the level of priority areas. So I think they'd like for us to see somewhat of a, a plan to, to tackle these, but they're not looking for us to have a, a really any of these things in full completion by the decennial visit in 2020. They would like and recommend that we develop a multi-year district technology plan. They would like and recommend for us to develop and implement um, a more co cohesive referral process to identify and support students in need of interventions. And in fact, we, we, we actually pretty much accomplished this uh, back in the winter. We created a, a, um, a fully flushed out and still looking to re you know, tweak and re revise it a little bit, but student support team um, flowchart uh, to, to identify students who are in need of intervention. So that's something that, that that second bullet point, we've uh, taken a step in the right direction to actually achieve that. Transparency around resources. This uh, is specifically around the building-based budget and the communication from the principal about what's a priority area and why uh, in terms of building-based budget. Uh, so that, that bullet point, the top on the right-hand side, that falls to me in my communication uh, with staff around what are we prioritizing um, in my building-based budget, in our building-based budget, and, and the why, which I guess has not happened, but will absolutely happen. Mm -hmm. um, we'll work to find, um, and they recommend that we work to find ways to create more common planning and collaborative time for faculty around student learning. Uh, so that could be, you know, one of the things that we've done this year in scheduling is that we've prioritized scheduling um, uh, special education uh, to make sure that that teachers who are co-planning uh, or co-teaching have co-planning time and they're, they're identified and they know that they're co-teaching uh, before the summer so that they have time to do that. So that's a small step and an example. Um, well, with not changing the schedule, um, at least not right now, um, to create more common planning time. If we identify teachers who are teaching together um, well ahead of time, make sure that they have common planning time built into their schedule, that will fulfill that particular recommendation. Next steps. Uh, so school improvement plan, which is right now um, a fully working draft um, and flushed out working draft. The school improvement plan needs to be aligned with the priority areas and recommendations. Um, so I've been hard at work at that with my leadership team. Uh, we're going to implement action steps in the school improvement plan using a, um, a, continu a continuous feedback loop, loop from stakeholders, surveys, interviews, focus groups, and data collection. Make adjustments as needed to the school improvement plan, which again is a living, breathing document um, as we make uh, adjustments. Targeted professional development to address the priority areas, and that is uh, already at work. Um, this uh, beginning in January, we have a cohort of teachers who are working with uh, landmark outreach uh, and specifically uh, around differentiation and meeting the needs uh, of learners and, and in a, a coaching model. So members of landmark uh, staff, outreach staff have come in, they've done observations and debriefs with a co our first cohort of teachers. Curriculum guides will be pu published by the end of June. 
which again are also not quite working drafts, but they are um, living documents as, um, as we get feedback and then as standards change, those guides will have to change as well and, and so it's, uh, they're living and breathing working documents. Um, we're going to be engaging with the leadership of Chris Kelly in a continuous curriculum review cycle. Following the curriculum guides, we're going to be um, drilling down a little bit deeper um, and working on internal documents, curriculum maps. We'll be involving multiple stakeholders in uh, forming a pre-K to 12 portrait of the graduate or vision of the graduate. Uh, so NEASC strongly, strongly recommends that all stakeholders are involved in this <coughs> process, especially if it's to be fully coordinated. I'm pretty excited about this work, Chris Kelly and I, along with Danielle Thyssen and um, Jennifer Hagopian went to a two-day training uh, around uh, the process of crafting a, a vision or portrait of the graduate, and it was very exciting two days, and we're um, looking forward to bringing the, this very exciting work here uh, to Reading with, with stakeholders. And then we prepare for our decennial visit in December of 2020. Um, Ms. Boynton, I think um, I'd like to offer the committee an opportunity to ask questions on Absolutely. this. Absolutely. So uh, before we do late start, 100%. Yes. Yep. So, I can't remember what, I think it was the, which slide it was where you showed. I'll go back, and you tell me when to stop. Yeah, sorry, I can't remember what it was called. Keep going. Okay. That one. Okay. So, how was that, what was the process for that? Did, when we, when did we come up with our ratings? For, did we get this report in advance? No, uh, no, no, no. So this report, is uh, a result of them looking, NEASC, um, the committee, looking at our own self-study report, which we had to have prepared and ready for them uh, prior to their visit. So it had to be prepared, and I th believe we voted in October um, for the priority areas. Staff voted. There was a presentation that was, that was done, and then staff voted on the priority areas. We then shared the results of that vote along with our self-study report with the NEASC team, I want to say about a month before their visit. Um, so it was just coincidental that they... Say that again? It was just coincidental that they aligned in a lot of areas. Yeah. Yes, what that tells me is we did a really good job with our self-study. We, we were very reflective and we truly identified the areas of need. I wasn't here for the self-study process, uh, only for the tail end of it. Um, the bulk of it took place in uh, beginning in 2016 into 2017, um, the beginning of the year 2018, and then by the time I, I was selected as principal, the self-study had, had pretty much been done, and then um, the self-study team was a comprehensive uh, a group of, of teachers representing all different departments and they were broken down by standard and they were in the process of writing their sort of results in the summer that I was hired, so last summer, uh, which was then finalized and, and presented to the faculty for a vote on the priority areas in the, in the fall. So I just had one other question yep. on, the, on the recommendations. Uh, is, will this report or will there be some type of report given to the to the uh, union leadership? Because uh, I think some of those could have collective bargaining implications, uh, right, John? The uh, planning in the, the next planning steps. time for the next the the next the steps. common planning I'm sorry, time. The, yeah. I mean, I think one, one of the ways we are addressing that recommendation, uh, in particular it, it with our, our co-teaching staff, is we're, we're prioritizing them in the scheduling so that teachers who are co-teaching know that they're co-teaching before the summer and they also have common planning time built in so their prep periods are the same. And that's a way to achieve that with really zero budget impact. Thank you. Ms. Borowski. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, um, and I'm very can, excited. Can you, can you move the mic closer? Oh. Sorry. Thank you for that presentation, and I'm very glad that um, that we're back involved with NEASC. This is very exciting. Can you go back to the priority areas? Sure. So as you were talking, oh, and this one right here. I, yes. Okay. As you were presenting, and as I was thinking about it, it seems like for three out of the four there's a fairly clear path forward. We need a written curriculum. It will be done by the end of the school year. We need this vision statement. People are already in professional development. We need to produce that document. Um, and then the last one, instructional practices, a little bit 
um, a little bit harder to wrap your hands around and identify, but professional development, it yes. seems like. And, and I really appreciated that you mentioned the coaching model, which is fantastic. So my question is about the third one, building a positive, respectful school culture. I appreciate that it was identified by both groups, and I appreciate the <coughs> transparency about tackling it. But my question is, how do you tackle that? Do you have any? <laughs> that seems like a, a tougher nut to crack and a tougher thing to, uh, to quantify. Is it working? Are we on the right path? So could you speak to that a little bit? I, I absolutely can. Um, so th this came this came up loud and clear in my entry plan, uh, the need to rebuild staff culture. Uh, and then the the trickle-down effect, as much as we like to think that it hasn't, but the trickle-down effect into the student um, culture, which it, there's 100% a, um, a relationship there. I, I would say that some of the small things that we've been doing so far, um, partnering with Amy Lannon from the library and Deb Gilberg, and we hosted two, we'll be hosting a third Pulse of RMHS Courageous Conversation. We had a Courageous Conversation in the fall. I would like to do the very same thing with my staff, uh, Courageous, uh, what, the Pulse of Pulse of RMHS teacher version, so I'm working with Deb and Amy to plan something for next year for staff. Uh, small things for staff uh, have gone a long <coughs> way. Having an agenda for meetings, keeping to the agenda, <laughs> communicating out every week newsletters, uh, establishing norms, um, you know, meeting norms, and holding people accountable to those meeting norms. So very small steps, I, I think, are, um, are what we're doing now, and I have some thoughts in, in terms of building my um, my leadership team uh, to then help continue to, to spread the building of culture within their departments. Uh, so the student side as well is the, the, the student conversations, those pulse of writing conversations have been really very powerful for kids and um, just keeping at that. Um, I think there are other small things that we can do that could have some very powerful impact uh, working with student council to sort of um, have them partner with other organizations, student organizations like A World of Difference to host speaker series on a regular basis with the theme of you know equity, diversity, and, and becoming a welcoming community. Uh, we're hosting an author visit uh, in, uh, in the springtime, uh, May 29th, and the, the, she wrote, uh, the Fernandez is her last name, and she uh, is a, um, a human trafficking survivor. So hearing people's stories, and I think you, you mentioned that as well with uh, Reading 375, the power of people's stories is what brings us together. Thank you and very so much. Those are just small things, but you, you're right, it's really, it's hard to measure. It is, but you know it when it's happening. Yeah. So thank you yes. very much. Um, I was just actually going to point out the worksheets that are around the room. They are here, yeah, and, and Linda was um, here for, for those uh, those conversations as well, and hopefully we'll be here on the 15th <coughs> for the third one. I hope so. Yeah, that. and if you walk out the um, the library, there is a board, and you'll see uh, the impact on our RMHS students of, and there are color-coded stickies, and that those are the student responses, and it's on a feeling wheel, so that how they're feeling about certain things. Um, so you'll see the result of those conversations uh, as you leave the library. Pretty powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. I really, oops, sorry. I really appreciated your answer to Ms. Browski's question because I think that it is the little things. And what I heard from students and, and heard this Sunday from a student who earned an award was that it was very powerful to feel listened to and that that trickles out as well. Um, yeah, I, I have students who are, you know, there's been the idea of a student of color um, organization, and I have students ready to start that, and, and what they decided they wanted to do was students of color and allies. Um, to, so it's those, those things that students are, I'm hearing and, and seeing that they're feeling more empowered to, to stand up um, and to, to have a voice. Yes, um, thank you for the presentation. A um, couple questions around the involvement of the SAC at, at, our, at Reading, at, at Reading Memorial High School. Can you talk about their involvement in this process um, in terms of the initial the school, school advisory council at the school and their involvement in the process, how they uh, contributed to the initial evaluation, whether they saw a draft of this before, how they could... You were talking about school council? Yes. Okay. Uh, and how they could, pr could provide feedback, because in the letter it says, here's a final version, which assumes there was a draft version. 
So um, can you talk a little bit about their involvement in that and their involvement in the school improvement plan and how that group by law is supposed to participate in that too? So how are they participating and what's the process there? Absolutely. So most of the work was done prior to me arriving with the, the self-study and it's my understanding <coughs> that the prior principal had the um, members of the NEASC team present on occasion to, to, to school council. Um, when, when I started in the fall, or when school started in the fall, we were waiting for the report to be done. We then had to wait for the, the, um, the collaborative conference to take place. So I didn't, really, I didn't meet with school council <coughs> about, about this. Um, not until the report was published and, and vetted and looked at by staff. So our, at our most recent meeting, which uh, occurred on Tuesday, is when um, I shared the results of the NEASC self-study report with school council uh, and a number of new members that are on, on school council. Uh, really beginning in at the beginning of the school year, um, in talking about my entry plan, I've shared <coughs> stages of my entry uh, of the school improvement plan with school council and asked for have asked for feedback pretty continuously uh, around that. Okay, um, one more question. Um, the vision related the, the vision of the graduate. Uh, in your last slide, I think it said specifically it was going to be a, a K through 12 vision of the graduate, or PK even, right? So we're talking about rise and everything, right? So. Um, but I think the constituents you talked about, other than maybe Ms. Kelly herself, are very high school focused. And maybe this is a question for Dr. Doherty or Ms. Kelly as opposed to yourself, but how are we going to get the rest of the involvement in that? And what is our role, considering the budget policy related stuff of school committee, that we should have in that process to build that portrait of the graduate, not just from a high school perspective, but it seems to be a district question, not a high school question. I'm happy to start it, or if you want to take it, John, that's fine. If you want to start it, go okay. ahead. So we're really in the, the beginning stages of this process, Chris and I having just gone to the, the training uh, around crafting a vision of the graduate. And one of the things that we were most excited to hear was that a, a number of districts, most districts, uh, Needham is, is an example, Bedford is another example, uh, are taking a comprehensive approach and really looking at the full experience of a student when they enter the doors of, of school in, in their district, whether it's pre-K or, or kindergarten, or maybe they arrive in third or, or fourth grade, because it all builds to the end this who is our graduate. Um, and th you know, the levels are interconnected, so we want to make sure that we're aligned and that we're interconnected and that, that we're building off, off of one another uh, so that we're perhaps not all having all all different um, value, core values. Maybe it means aligning our core values. Um, maybe you know, it, lo it looks at the transition from kindergarten to first grade, and, and what is that? You know, what are the skills and dispositions we want those students to have when they leave elementary to middle school, or then when they leave middle school to high school? So it was very exciting to hear and see some of the work in other districts that are taking this comprehensive, uh, full child uh, approach, and we've really just now started the conversations about what might that look like as a process? Yeah, the only other thing I want to add is this, these discussions, which we will have community opportunities for it to happen, are going to help also inform our district improvement plan, which is up for renewal. So. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Parks. One of the accommodations was a level class. What type of feedback are you getting from students and teachers about what's going on with that at this time? Yeah, I think we're in a transition period, quite frankly. I, I think we are uh, in a transition time uh, around that. There's been some positive feedback and there's been some critical feedback. Uh, and I think working with Landmark is going to really be very beneficial for our staff and our students in the long run uh, in order to create a learning environment that supports the needs of, of all learners. Uh, so there, you know, there has been some positive feedback and there's been critical. So we've heard sort of a range. Uh, and I think, you know, our, our teachers, uh, there needs to be some professional development in order to, mm -hmm. to um, provide some skill, uh, as well as I think just a little bit of confidence, if you will, uh, it, that they can do this. <coughs> um, because they can, they're talented, talented educators. 
proceed to the late start update? Sure. Thank you. So we'll be having our, our next and uh, final meeting this year of the Homework and Activities Working Group uh, on May 15th. And there'll be recommendations that come from that from that group guidelines recommendations um, potentially around homework around um, time for activities uh, things like that we've determined that the building will be open by 730 for students uh, the cafeteria will be available uh, for them breakfast will be available by 745 we're asking that students unless they have an appointment with teachers uh, to re remain in those common areas until 8.15, uh, unless uh, an appointment is made with a specific teacher. We're working with the PTO, and I had a meeting with the PTO board last Friday uh, to have the library open. And it's this actually, we're looking to see if students will use it uh, more than two times a week. So right now we've tentatively planned for Wednesday and Friday, um, but one of the steps I think I would like to take is to uh, send a survey out to students to see where the interest is for um, use of the library. Is it going to be, uh, would they be more interested in using <coughs> it in the morning, in the afternoon, or potentially both? So a really quick survey to send out to students to get, um, to gauge uh, usage of library. Um, the, the PTO generously staffs uh, uh, supervision for the library um, one, actually uh, five afternoons a week, and so we're looking um, to best allocate that time based on student need. So that should be adjusted because we need to really see where students, where their interest lies in utilizing the library and where most of the interest lies, that's where the, the scheduling will be. The cafeteria will be, will be monitored the first several weeks by the school administrative team uh, and then periodically throughout. So we're gonna be really out and about, uh, I like to call it kind of a full court press, but we'll be out and about um, in the school monitoring um, when students are here, where they are, uh, and reinforcing the message that the common areas uh, are where um, students uh, can congregate, they can socialize. In the library, it's for um, collaborative work, studying, working on the computer, et cetera. We are committed to not simply adding another hour tacked on to the end of the day, but really looking to readjust how we do things. That goes back up to the work and the recommendations of the homework and activities working group and that uh, we will continue communication and collaboration with uh, town youth sports and the recreation department for field use and scheduling. So those will be ongoing conversations. And um, the work of the homework and activities working group will be to monitor how things are going with the late start and, and report out. So uh, as we make this important transition uh, to a later start time, the homework and activities working group will be getting feedback, will be monitoring how things are going, and, and report out how things are going. Um, so those are, it's a very brief update, but I think they're pretty significant updates as well. And, and questions. Yeah, I see that um, Mr. Zaya is here, so I was wondering um, if there's any update regarding, you know, ath athletics, how things are going in terms of, um, if there's any shifts that you needed in terms of, you know, the time between the end of classes and the, the when kids have to be on the bus or be ready, you know, suited up and ready to go. Um, just maybe a quick update on that front. You need to go to the mic. Oh, you got to go to the mic. Top. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Make him stand up too, huh? <laughs> Otherwise, no one can hear. Yeah. So right now, with school getting out at around uh, two eleven, making that shift to three o two. Uh, we're envisioning practices or, uh, starting somewhere around 3.30. A uh, little time afterwards, not as much time as, as there currently is. Um, there might be f uh, some benefits to this time switch as far as transportation goes. Right now, if we have away games, our buses we order for around 2.30. I can honestly say we get buses between 2.30 and 3.20. Um, so with that later start for the, the, school, the, the school buses that are doing school runs in town, <laughs> We actually may be getting out of, out of our district a little bit uh, more efficiently. Um, as leagues, we have this year started most of our games between 4 and 4.30. Uh, there are already five districts that are with a later start. So with us going to a later start, I, I don't see it being that big of a change as far as uh, games and, and getting to and from activities go. Um, practices, again, starting somewhere around 3.30. There are some venues that 
uh, I'm going to make it a little bit more challenging as far as things like daylight, securing venues, um, the hockey rink, the swimming pool are a challenge, but I think they're definitely, they're, they're obviously things that we're, we're working on with those groups and have, I think, some pretty good plans in place. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? We used to have a question from Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, what about pra when you said practices as, as a Coaches at this point, at this point in time, all signed on that there's a hard stop, and you know you can't go and you know because of the it's starting later. You, you doesn't mean you get to go later necessarily. Yeah, so we've we've discussed this with with most of our teams. Uh, it will be all of our teams right now. Uh, for many of our fields, we have a time that we we have to be off for practices. Uh, we've been communicating with many of our youth groups. Um, games for our varsity, we're allowed to finish. Our sub varsity, uh, we're talking with the recre recreation department, <coughs> excuse me, recreation department and youth groups, youth teams, about uh, our sub varsity ending times. Thank you. Mr. Weiss. I don't know who can answer the question, actually. I mean, Ms. Boynton, thank you for putting the presentation together. This is kind of more of a general late start question, so maybe Mrs. Kelly, you might yeah. be the most appropriate to answer. Have we heard any other impact post the survey that was done last November, December about younger child, older child, right, and the pickup issue and family impacts as a result, and do we think or have we heard as part of the extended day feedback that there's a relationship between that and the spike in extended day um, sign-ups? So I don't think, I, I don't think, um, we haven't heard that. We have had an open survey opportunity, uh, which Ms. Boynton has publicized in her Rocketeer every week, um, asking questions about that. We have not publicized that beyond the high school community, and that's a good point. We could ask um, elementary principals and middle school principals to send that out. To date, we've gotten two responses. One was athletics um, specific, and Ms. Dezea sent a reply right away, and one was another one, and I sent a reply right away. So that's an open window. We're not going to close that, um, and we will certainly, it's one of those that you have to leave your email address so that we can get back to you, um, and that's our plan. So <clears throat> Ms. Boynton and I will send that out with a little caveat to the other schools and say, given the fact that the high school has a late start, please let us know of some of the questions or, or concerns that you have, and somebody will get back to you about, or and it may be an elementary principal that has to get back or, or something like that. Um, because we haven't used extended date, we haven't used a lot of high school staff specifically for care, um, we don't anticipate a problem. Um, we will still continue to employ high school kids if, if they want to and if we need them, but we'll, they're, they're extras, so that's not an issue. As far as like families relying on high school staff, <coughs> I mean, the spike was, was great this year, but we had a spike last year, and Late Start wasn't part of the equation. So um, I think, you know, it, in the years, we, like, continue, like, 100 more every year. So it's, traject it's, it's sort of projecting that way, and I think a lot of it, I'm just being frank, has to do with the real estate prices. Most families with school-age kids need two incomes, and people are working. Um, and when I was raising my kids, I, like, when my daughter, who's 27, was in kindergarten, I was the only full-time working mom in that class. That's not true anymore. So, you know, the reality is that that's where we're at. Do I think it impacts some families? Absolutely. Are we going to do what we can do to support them? Absolutely. But as far as um, hearing lots of, of people, we haven't been. Okay. I'd be very curious if uh, maybe in our end of May meeting we can get a quick update if you have heard anything. I'd be happy to. Out. Yep. Because I think the earlier feedback was that it didn't go to a broad enough audience, mm. right. right, in terms of the people that would be impacted, because it initially went only to the high school and maybe the eighth grade parents. It and did. It went out from us that way, but then it was disseminated beyond right. that. The seventh and sixth yeah. grade and mm -hmm. other parents. We got 980 so. responses, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. But we'll be happy to do that. Kate and I will take Absolutely. care of that yeah. either tomorrow or Monday. Oh, sorry, Ms. Williams. Oh, I saw her hand up. It's fine. Alicia Williams, I just had a quick question about busing. Uh, have you determined if there'd be a greater need for paid buses because of the late start? And uh, do you have the capacity in the buses for increased ridership? Uh, and I'm talking about the paid buses, the $450 for parents. So we've set up the routes, um, and it, in a couple of weeks we'll be sending out information regarding the buses. We don't anticipate we're going to need additional buses. 
the buses that we have right now, are, we have two runs going, and we've set it up in a way so that each run will hit the elementary. It's gonna hit the middle school first, then the elementary. I'm sorry, middle school, high school, and then elementary. So we don't anticipate that there'll be um, additional need for buses. Okay, and are you sending out the information earlier because it's there's a change or no? You're sending it at the same time? No, same time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. There's another question. Uh, Mrs. Lieberman. Hi, I was just wondering if uh, guidance counselors would be made available um, in the mornings before school starts with the late start. Because it's always a challenge for no. kids to find. So the guidance staffing, won't be open. The staffing times, all t guidance counselors are teachers, and so their staffing hours are the same as, as uh, other teachers. I think it would be appointment, the, your statement said by appointment, right? So appointment. If, if there was an appointment prior to yeah. that time. At the discretion of the staff member. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ms. Dr. Yeah. Boxer, sorry. No, no problem. My question actually was very similar to, to Ms. Lieberman's in that um, you said that, <coughs> sorry, the staffing, the administration was going to be um, moving amongst the early, the kids that come early in the cafeteria and the library. and. Do you have a longer term plan in terms of that kind of supervision as opposed to meetings? But Right now, we, um, we very loosely supervise the cafeteria. Students kind of flow in and they grab a bite to eat and just socialize. It's very, very, it's very low key in the morning. They are, they're there just socializing with friends. They wait till the 725 bell and they make their way to class. Uh, so I, don't, I really don't anticipate anything much different than, than, than this year. Really, if you if you take a look, I, I wander frequently through the hallways and in the you know in the cafeteria in the morning, and it's just it's very low key. We want to monitor um, much much more, so it'll be myself and my assistant principals out and about um, monitoring the common areas, especially just to get a feel for is it the same, which we anticipate, um, or is it more? Uh, and then uh, you know out uh, out and about in the parking lots as well, just kind of monitoring how the traffic patterns are going and and making sure students are parking in the right places, you know, where students are supposed to park. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so you uh, can I just add one thing to that? So when we uh, formed our committee this year, Kate and I also surveyed uh, the other communities in our league who have already moved to Late Start, and they did not see a tremendous growth in kids coming early. They also opened their buildings early, as we will. We definitely got that feedback from community members that they're like, I need to be at the train or whatever. We're gonna open the building, but what they said is people found other rides, kids carpooled or things happened. A lot of kids wanted to sleep. Mm -hmm. So they thought they would have tremendous growth. And frankly, our breakfast folks are hoping for it, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Um, and I think yeah, we're gonna have to really look at that. And if we need to provide other strategies for supervision we will but we're not looking at hundreds of kids being here it, most teenagers want to sleep in the morning um, and parents do have to get to work we get that but a lot of kids walk could walk and don't I know my kids always could walk and didn't um, my, if they could sleep an hour they probably would have walked mm -hmm. you know thank you Dr. Doxer. sorry I did that just triggered a question for me I did read somewhere and I can't say where I read it about or maybe heard it about um, some additional funding for crossing guards. Oh, that was on and the town budget. Somewhere. That would be on the town Town side. budget. Okay, because that made me think yeah. that um, will there still be flexibility to look at that for some of the tough crossing places like 129 and um, by the library? There, there in police department. I mean, yeah. we would certainly look at that with the police department, but really it is the police the department's police call. Department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Kate. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, everybody. You. Um, okay, we have the vote on the last day of school and then the superintendent's evaluation process. Yes, I do. Good news is we had one snow day this year. Yeah. 
bad news is that we have to end school on Monday, June 17th. <laughs> um, under Massachusetts general law, we have to go to school 180 days. So 180 days will bring us to Monday, June 17th. I know people are asking, can we figure out a way? Can we add more hours? Can yeah. No, we have to go 180 days. That's, that's part of uh, the regulations. So um, the, uh, the last day of school, when you count it out, is Monday, June 17th. So I am recommending to the school committee that they approve that as the last day of school. And they have Dr. Doxer read the motion, and then we'll Move to approve the recommendation that June 17, 2019 be the last day of school. Second. Second. Mrs. Borowski. It's not really a question, but I guess it's a question. Just a clarification. It's an 11 o'clock dismissal district-wide that day. It's an 11 o'clock dismissal for students. Just, That's yeah. correct. It's a full day for staff. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? I had middle schoolers asking for Saturdays. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. And Gardy, um, before we just, um, as Dr. Gardy is getting started, before we just jump into this, um, I wanted to just say a couple things, um, given also that we have brand new board members. Um, and uh, Dr. Gardy and I did meet with. Um, Mr. Wise and Mr. Parks to try to give them a little bit of an overview. Uh, but I wanted to just set the context for the evaluation process. So the goal setting and performance review process that's used by the school committee for um, superintendents is largely defined by the Ed Reform Law, DESE. And school committee members have a responsibility to work with the superintendent to set the goals and objectives for the superintendent in the district. And that's, that was done in November, November 1st, and that's pretty typical in our district, and that's a three-year view of the goals. Throughout the year, we are responsible for monitoring progress, and we do this by scheduling, and that's ch the chair's responsibility, scheduling the school committee agendas um, to include topics consistent with the goals. I uh, do that very collaboratively, co collaboratively with Dr. Darty. Um, and conferring with our um, MASD field director, she emphasized two important points. And that was the value of the narrative as constructive performance feedback, and that the evaluation is done from the perspective and lens of serving school committee member based on their experience while on the committee. Um, this evening, we will review the timeline that Dr. Darty has, uh, that, that's in our packet, as well as Dr. Darty will present his year end update. So, Dr. Darty. Thank you. So, before I, I begin, just a, a little context on. The process um, with this is the beginning of a several week process for the school committee um, it's really a lot of this is regulated by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, we do similar processes um, with other staff um, so I am doing this with building principals and central office administrators right now building principals are doing this with their teachers so this is the time of year where we start um, having meetings and having discussions uh, for the summative evaluations. Um, so the one difference with the process that you're doing is that everything is done in public, uh, whereas the other ones are not done in public. <laughs> so, um, and I'll go a little bit more into that in a, in a minute. As much as this is an evaluation of the superintendent, it really is also an evaluation of all of the work that we're doing in our school district. And um, you know, you'll see later a lot of data. Um, some of it is data from a year ago, which is unfortunately the way the cycle works. Um, some of it is current data that has been going on right now and, and for this year. But I will tell you that it is due to the hard work of principals, central office administrators, teachers, um, there's a lot of good things happening in this district right now. And, um, and I'll go into a little bit of that as, as we go through this. But I just want to give a tremendous thank you um, to the central office administrators that are here um, and our building principals, uh, because without their efforts in the movement of our district improvement plan 
and the goals um, that I'm going to update you on, my, my goals, um, which is not just my goals. There are people, other people that have similar goals um, in the district. Uh, a lot of this would not be happening. So I do want to, I do want to say that up front. I'm going to walk you through several documents. I think Mrs. Engelson told me there was 142 pages of evaluation documents, something like that. Um, so I want to start first with the memo. So the memo is right after the last day of school memo. Um, so I'm going to walk the committee through that piece first, and then we're going to I'm going to go through the rest of the PowerPoint, and then I'm going to walk you through. Um, a, a packet of data that has been put together um, largely in part by our data coach Courtney Bogarty who does similar data packets um, for individual buildings so that the principals are using these the, the individual data as well for their for their buildings <clears throat> so in terms of the process this is the fifth step fifth and final step of the process it's called the summative evaluation step. Um, as Mrs. Webb said, uh, the beginning of the process is the goal piece, and that happened uh, in November when the committee approved the goals for, for the year. Um, and so the way that this process works is that over the next several weeks, the committee is going to review the data that's been presented and other data that you have in your observations of the of my performance um, throughout this year in your role as a school committee member um, as you do your summative piece so I'll, I'll walk you through that in in a minute what I want to do first is I want to go to the timeline which is the last page four of the memo so <coughs> this evening you're going to hear the presentation and then from May 9th to May 24th, uh, you are going to complete a draft copy of the evaluation form. And that evaluation form um, is not in here. Or, or is it? Yes, it, yeah, is it is. Yes, it is. So there are two pieces to the form. The first piece is the actual rubric. That is not something you would submit in, but that is your working document for your own use because it's the rubric which is the details of the actual um, evaluation that you'll be completing. So if you, and unfortunately we couldn't figure out a way to number all the pages without doing it manually, but there is a document called Reading Public Schools Superintendent Evaluation, which is the actual rubric that you're gonna be using. So just to give you a crash course in this, this document right here, in that rubric, the very first page of that document, goes over the different standards that you're going to be doing the evaluation on. So there are four standards. Um, and actually, all the central office administrators have the same four standards. The principals um, have slightly different standards, and teachers have slightly different standards. But um, the four standards are instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. Underneath each standard, there are what are called indicators. Um, and under each indicator, there are what are called elements. So you notice under standard one, standard one on instructional leadership, uh, there are five indicators, uh, A through E, curriculum, instruction, assessment, evaluation, and data-informed decision-making. And then you notice under each indicator, there are two <coughs> numbers, or three numbers, depending on uh, the indicator. Those are what are called elements. So how that fits in is that you will see a rubric for each standard with several indicators underneath each one. And then you'll see four rating categories exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, and unsatisfactory. And there are descriptors in each of those categories that explain what that would look like for each of the ratings. So that's the first document. And it's there for you as a guide 
it's up to you if you want to use it or not. But that's kind of the detailed information um, that you do not have to submit. But if you back up to the document just before that in the packet. You know, this rubric is, um, it, it helps to align all of us. So, you know, to, to make sure that um, we're all at least looking at a rubric that defines what the different performance levels are and we're using that. I, I know I was saying when we first started this process, I, I don't know with Superintendent Scatini years ago, I think, um, there was no rubric like that. And it was very difficult to know was, you know, Dr. Dr. <coughs> the same as mine. So I think it's a really important tool for us to use as we go through and, and do the evaluation. So the document just before that is labeled Superintendent Evaluation, Summative Evaluation for 2018-19 School Year. This is the document that you would be submitting um, to both myself, as a draft, to both myself and Ms. Borowski, correct? Um, and that will be happening during the May 9th to May 24th time frame. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So in this document, and the best thing to do with this document is to work backwards. Um, it's not, it's counterintuitive. So if you start at the back of the document, you'll notice that all of the standards and indicators that I was referring to earlier are here. And what you would do is you would check the boxes that you feel are the best rating in your professional judgment as a school committee member for each of the indicators. And then you would give an overall rating for each standard. So if you look at standard two, I'm looking at management and operations, standard two, <coughs> there are five indicators listed. You would put a rating for each of those five indicators and then you would give an overall rating for standard two. Um, Again, that's your professional judgment, what the overall rating should be. How you get to that overall rating, there is no mathematical formula. That is up to you, again, as an individual school committee member, what that rating should be overall. Um, and then there is a comment box under each standard for you to put in comments. Um, if you put a uh, rating of proficient, you are not required to put a comment, although you are certainly welcome to. If you put anything other than proficient, you are required to put a comment as to why the rating was given that was given. Um, so once you have completed the standards and the indicators, you then would go to the beginning of the document and you'll notice that on page three, and four of the document are the goals, uh, the individual goals for the superintendent and the focus areas, which are your district improvement plan goals. So you would give the, <coughs> the goals one of five ratings, ranging from did not meet to exceeded. And again, that would be based on the evidence that's been submitted. Um, and your own observations over the last last year. <coughs> then if you continue um, to the beginning of the document, um, this is where you now would take the information that you put in for the goals, and where it says step one, um, you would circle where you feel the professional practice goals, the student learning goals, and the district improvement plan goal ratings should be. And then you would put the ratings that you generated from the previous pages <coughs> for your overall um, ratings. And then you determine an overall summative rating for all four standards. And then your evaluator comments go into step four. So that's happening during the time frame of May 9th through 24th, you would send the draft to um, myself and Ms. Borowski. And then from May 24th to June 3rd, um, Mrs. Engelson is going to set up individual meetings with each of you where I will meet and go over the draft document. 
and um, it, it really is a two-way conversation in terms of things, questions you may still have um, or questions I may have. The whole basis of this process is to is for continuous growth and improvement. Um, then based on that conversation, you can either submit the evaluation as a final copy as is, or you can make changes and then submit the final copy with the changes. And again, that would go to um, Ms. Borowski and myself. <coughs> Ms. Borowski then does a compilation of the uh, six committee members um, and comments. And she can talk about that piece <laughs> if she, um, in much more detail than I can. Um, the, the committee does not see the final compilation or anyone else's evaluations until it is a public document when the packet is released around June 24th. So I just want to add that the, um, again, I had a lengthy conversation with our field director and <coughs> some issues last year that related to um, not school committees but other um, municipal committees. And all of the school committees conduct this process in this manner. And um, so it's really, it's really, it is really important that these emails, you know, those, those documents go just to Dr. Doherty and, <coughs> and <clears throat> no other committee member will see that until it comes to the public. Um, I, I just also want to add that the, um, as far as the compilation process and, and participating in the process, you know, when we have um, new members to the committee can be uh, new, the first time doing a performance review either because you've just recently been elected or maybe appointed at some point in time. And so it's really important to consider, um, you know, that this work needs to be done from the perspective as a school committee member in your role as a school committee. Uh, in your role on the school committee. And there are ways to participate in this that um, over, over time members may sometimes participate by just pr providing a narrative if they don't feel like they have enough information um, at, or, and, and also only provide that on some portions of the standard. So um, whereas uh, most of us who have been on the board for the last couple of years and have been here from the goal setting <coughs> process should be able to participate fully in, in uh, all aspects. So um, I think that this gives the time and also when those meetings are set up, once your meeting is set up with Dr. Darty, you really need to make sure that that draft gets to Ms. Sprowski and Dr. Darty, you know, a couple of days, at least a day, um, but preferably a few days in advance so that Dr. Darty can have a chance to look at it before you we are each individually meeting with him. So. There's a question. Um, uh, sure. Just regarding the Dropbox that it's not open, is it available to the public or no? And if not, why not? I can make the link available. Essentially, it's all the public documents. There are a couple things that aren't, haven't been public, but it's agendas and things like that. It's all the public documents that we've been presenting all year, but I'm more than happy to make it available. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If you want to fall asleep some night, mm. it's really good reading. <laughs> She's probably read them all already. <laughs> 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 all right. So, um, oh, um, did, oh, I'm sorry. I did, you you'd mentioned that I could talk a little bit about the process, and just because we have two new committee members, I, you guys are well versed in the process, but just so um, our newer members know, the approach that I take, I actually use an Excel spreadsheet for the, um, I use an Excel spreadsheet for the actual ratings, and I add up the numbers and divide by six. So it is not me eyeballing or interpreting, it really is a numerical average. If it's above 0.5, it gets rounded up. If it's below 0.5, it gets rounded down. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, in terms of the comments, I read through all the comments. That's actually the, the part that takes the longest <laughs> amount of time. Um, I actually read everyone's comment with a notebook pa paid. I, the first one I get in, I have a notebook paper, and every point that's made, I made a note. And then I'll read the second person's evaluation. And if the same point is made, I put a check mark. And if something is clearly the consensus of the committee, I'll include it in summative comments. If only one or two committee members bring up something, it gets published in, uh, under your name in the website. All of our evaluations are published in public documents on the website with our names attached to them. So what you had to say would still be perfectly transparent to the public. Um, but if I were to include everyone's individual comments, 
it just becomes unmanageable, and I don't think it's a productive a, a document for Dr. Doherty. I, I think what the summative school committee evaluation is supposed to be is a reflection of the consensus of the committee. So just to clarify, and if either of you have any questions about the process, you can certainly touch base with me. Thank you. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through the presentation. Uh, there are some areas I will go through quickly. Um, in some areas I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on. Um, so the Dropbox material, which was just brought up, I can certainly send that out. Uh, in the packet are four documents that uh, really are connected to the evidence, the memo on the process. This presentation, updated goals in the district improvement plan, and then uh, a document that is a little bit more comprehensive this year because we are in the third year of of the district improvement plan, um, the progress monitoring document. And I want to thank Courtney Fogarty for putting that together. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of work. So here is the goal for the district improvement plan that's uh, been um, ongoing for the last three years. Um, it really is not the only goal because underneath this goal there have been four focus areas which you could argue are goals in them themselves. Um, and judging by the, the action plan steps, I, I think you, you could verify that. So it really is, and this, this journey began really when we first started getting the grant, the School Climate Transformation Grant. Um, where we were beginning to implement the multi-tiered system of support. So the genesis of the district improvement plan f five years ago, because <coughs> we're in the fifth year of the grant, was the MTSS. And then when we came up with the last district improvement plan, um, that really became the, the basis for the, the process. <coughs> Here are the four focus areas, um, closing the achievement gap, which would label action plan A, literacy, which is action plan B, mathematics practices, action plan C, and social emotional learning, action plan D. These have been consistent throughout the three years of the plan. I should probably mention, which I forgot to, in the Dropbox, um, tried to organize it as best as possible so that you have folders for each of the action plans, you have folders for each of the four standards, um, and I'm trying to think what else is in there. You have a folder that has all of the uh, documents that are in the packet um, as well. So there is some redundancy. There is some overlap because a lot of these, there, there is by nature. Um, so you may see a couple of documents more than once. Some of the projects we're prioritizing this year based on the focus areas. So uh, at the elementary level, there's been a big focus on readers and writers workshop. There's been a lot of ensuing professional development that's been going with that. Um, this is the third and final year of science curriculum implementation, which has been focused primarily in K-2 uh, and 9 through 12. Um, and obviously, there's been ongoing implementation in, at the middle school for previous, previous years. Um, advisory at the middle school, you saw presentations April 11th uh, on this topic, both middle schools and the work that they've been doing. Uh, the level consolidation you heard this evening uh, from Ms. Boynton, um, that that's an area that the high school's been working on. We also have done some level consolidation uh, in middle school math um, over the last two years. I'm going to show some data a little bit later on that. Um, review of the special education language-based programs. So in the Dropbox, there is the action plan that's been going on all year for the bridge program and the work that's been happening with our uh, vertical team there. I believe Allison has mm -hmm. been the one coordinating that, our assistant director. Um, the school climate survey, which was actually administered last May and June. We did have the high school students took it in September because uh, we weren't logistically able to do it last spring. So that data is pretty close to a year old now. Um, and then a lot of other professional development activities due to the hard work of Chris and her team. Um, the Reading Spring Institute, which focused on equity, inclusion, social justice. Uh, we've had math workshops, math mini lessons uh, for the middle school. There's been training on managing anxiety. Both staff and students participated in that. Um, 
And then also middle school math teachers have been focusing on differentiating math instruction to reach all students. Is that connected to the level consolidation piece in math? We've also had training at the middle and high school on inclusive practices. Uh, there's been instructional rounds that have been going on, uh, which are called two different things depending on the middle school. Uh, and I know that was discussed in the April 11th presentation. Uh, QBS training has been ongoing. Um, and then, of course, you heard a presentation tonight on NEASC accreditation work. Um, last November, several of our teachers participated in NPEN, um, which we will continue to do next year. Uh, we've also been having the sheltered English immersion courses and recertification <laughs> workshops around sheltered English immersion and English language learners. Uh, we've had special education recertification workshops. There are also going to be those workshops happening this summer um, as part of the Reading Summer Institute. Um, so there's a, uh, and then we've had some math perspective training going on in K-2 and youth mental health first aid training has been going on as well. Uh, all of our new teachers participate in that and we are also going to be doing some additional work in that early next fall for any staff that may have not received that yet. Uh, there's also been health curriculum work going on at the elementary school, um, particularly. <coughs> and then we've had some uh, professional de de development activities going on, as I mentioned earlier, with the bridge program. Um, and you can see there that there's been several action steps happening that are aligned to the original action plan that was presented to the committee in September. And that is also in the Dropbox, that, that information. So what I want to do now is walk you through the other two documents, which is the district improvement plan and the individual goals and give you a review of the progress that's been made on the, the action steps. So, um, and this, this has gotten fine-tuned over the last three years. Uh, so it, if it's green, it's been completed or it's ongoing. If it's yellow, uh, it's initial progress has begun, but some steps are not completed. And if it's blue or white, it's been planned. Um, so what I've tried to do is create a chart to show you the progression over the last three years of the plan. So with the closing achievement gap, um, pretty much all of the action steps have been completed for um, this, this action, for this, for this part of the, yeah, no. the plan. So some of the highlights, and I will refer you to the other document, which is this document here. So what I tried to do is connect the pages on the slides to this document. So pages 4 through 18, Highlight Action Plan A. I'm going to go into that a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, so in Action Plan A, uh, there's been a lot of work going on using data at each school. So our data coach has been working with the building leadership teams and the building principal with different types of data and it is connected to their school improvement plans on what data they are working on. So if the data was showing that they, were, that they needed to work in areas in math, for example, numeracy, um, which one of our schools is doing in their school improvement plan, um, then they would be focusing a lot of their work in that area this year. So, um, so that, that's an example. Uh, all schools are using intervention blocks. Um, or after school supports for students who may be struggling in, in the areas. Um, so there's been also discussions about the uh, levels and the collapsing of the levels and at the different, uh, both the middle school and the high school. And then, um, as Mrs. Kelly has, has reported to you, and I believe also Ms. Boynton did this evening, uh, the curriculum guides in ELA, math, science, and behavioral health, <laughs> will be, done. they're done in grades K through five. Um, and 9 through 12, they will be done by the end of the school year. And grade 6 through 8 guides are going to be completed next year. And those are on, the K through 5 are on the uh, learning and teaching website now. Dr. Dory, real quick question on that. The, um, the actual 
thing you gave us says that K through eight is done. Did we change the goal and therefore just agree to do K through five and nine through 12? Because the actual document. The action step you're talking about. The action step set for complete. It says complete for K through eight, even though we know only K through five is done. Yeah, it, it, we had to change it. It was just basically a capacity issue that we need, you know. Um, yeah, I, I believe that. I just, I'm, I understand it. I just think it's a difference of ongoing versus complete in that particular case. Just a minor, minor issue probably. Okay. <clears throat> <coughs> and I think the switch to 9 to 12 is appropriate considering what we heard from Nisa after this one. Yeah. The question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For action plan B, uh, which is literacy, again, you can see um, we have made progression in action steps being complete, some in process, and some are planned, um, and a determination will be made uh, for our next district improvement plan and whether or not these are ones that we should be focusing on or uh, changing, changing course. So some of the highlights, as I mentioned earlier, the Readers and Writers Workshop is being implemented in grades K through five. Um, that will continue next year. Uh, that's gonna be a multi-year process, but all of the schools are now up and running in both areas. Um, and there's some exciting things happening um, across the board there. Um, there's been more of an emphasis being placed on calibration of benchmarks. Um, Founders and Pinnell in particular. Uh, I do have some data that in, in pages 19 to 27 that indicate that. Uh, that. There's been more of a focus on comprehension, appropriate instructional text and writing, reading connection, which is aligned with our standards. Uh, there's been coaching support this year through professional development. Um, there's been half day workshops that have been going on uh, and lab classrooms with the, uh, the at the elementary level, um, so those are those are some of the things that have been happening with literacy. And then moving on to the mathematics practice, which is after action plan C. Um, again, you could see the progression. There have been some steps completed since last year, some more in process, um, and still some that are being planned. So again, the related data is in pages 28 to 35. Um, we have AMC assessments being administered in grades K through two at all the elementary schools. Um, and they're taking the results of that data and applying it into the classroom on different areas that need to be focused on for the students. Um, through the work of Heather Leonard, uh, the training for AMC assessments have been continuing and how to use the math workshop model. Um, you can see that we're moving more to a workshop model, not just in literacy, but in math as well at the elementary level. Mentioned earlier, we've had professional development and differentiated instruction at the middle school. Um, and a lot of this has been funded through various sources, grant, school climate transformation grant, Title IIA grant funding. Um, as, as the funding sources for a lot of the professional development that has happened this year. And you're gonna see some data also um, in the data packet that we are seeing more students accessing higher level courses um, over the last few years and the new secondary math sequences are beginning to be implemented. And then moving on to action plan D, uh, which is the social emotional learning piece. Uh, a significant amount of work has been done in this area over the last three years, um, which really was the genesis of the School Climate Transformation Grant when we started five years ago. Um, so it would be anticipated that a lot more work has been done in this area. So you can see that pretty much things are either complete or in process. So this includes late start. Um, Grade three to five health education, the ESPERT process, which is now in its second year. Um, we've had over 40 teachers enrolled in the lift trauma courses through Leslie College, um, or Leslie University, sorry. Um, 18 have completed all four, uh, which is significant. Um, our building leadership teams have used, have been focusing on behavioral health for the last couple of years. Um, Lawrence Beller is our behavioral health coach and she's been doing an amazing job 
working with all of the schools and successfully implementing um, the, the different levels of MTSS. And then we continue with our youth mental health first aid and trauma courses being offered for staff. I do want to go also to the early evidence of change charts, which are at, at the end of each of the focus areas. And it just shows, again, um, and I tried to keep it color coded. Um, you can see the progress that's been made um, in, in the different areas over the three year span. Um, there's a few that w they were added. So, I mean, we do the goals and objectives every year. A couple of these, um, there were additional, I was just looking at those numbers. It looks like you might have added additional goals. We may have added a action steps, you mean? Um, action steps, yeah, probably. Yeah, action steps, yes. yeah. So, yes. So that's the district improvement plan. Now I'm going to shift to the end of the year update of the my individual goals. Um, which I mentioned earlier, there are others that have similar goals. Um, this first one is directly tied to the district improvement plan. Um, so everything that I just went over is connected to this goal. The second goal, which is a new goal, is the physical and psychological security of the schools. Um, this will most likely be um, a multi-year goal or it may be modified a little bit next year, um, depending on what direction we go with our district improvement plan. Um, but there's been, as you can see, significant amount of work in this area as well. Some of the action steps in this goal align with the next goal um, because it involves the security implementation um, as well as part of the capital planning. Some of the highlights of this goal include updated emergency safety operation plans, uh, which happened last summer. There's been um, several drills throughout the year, including a multi-department active shooter drill without students at Killam last June um, after school ended. Uh, there's been several safety workshops that, that myself and staff have attended. Uh, we've done tabletop safety exercises with district and building administrators. We've worked very closely with police and town and community officials to educate and address school and community acts of hate. That's been an ongoing process all year, as you know. Um, and then, of course, most recently, um, we received town meeting support for funding to implement the safety and security measures across town and school buildings. And then moving on to the multi-year capital plan, this most likely will continue next year. Um, and each of the capital projects are at different stages and <coughs> we've been getting ongoing updates from Mrs. Dowd and Mr. Huggins on this and we'll get another one um, on June 27th. Um, so this one will, will continue next year. So the highlights of this, um, was the uh, funding, as I mentioned, for the safety and security measures. Uh, there was support to replace Turf 2. Um, that was approved at town meeting. And then we are currently working on, with the consultant, on the elementary space and enrollment study. So you'll continue to get updates on, on these projects, and this goal will continue on for next year. And then uh, another new goal that we a lot of us have been involved with is capacity building and role definition. Um, and this one, this one is for a variety of reasons. We, we had new central office administrators coming on board. We had relocation of offices. We had redefined roles and responsibilities. So we felt the need that this goal should happen this year. Most likely this goal will not be in its current form next year because a lot of the action steps have been uh, completed. Um, so it may look a little bit different or with this goal just may be uh, an ongoing goal that we just do internally. Um, and that font is very small. Uh, so, so some of the big highlights is reorganizing central office that happened in which includes also 
not just the physical uh, relocation, uh, but the uh, changing of some roles and responsibilities, uh, including the CFO's responsibilities, assistant superintendent for learning and teaching, um, central office leadership team working now that we're all in the same area, much more cohesively uh, able to um, solve problems, talk about problems um, in a more efficient and effective manner. Uh, also making sure the district leadership teams reflect the direction that we're going with school, with the district improvement plan and our goals. Um, and then building principals also building their own capacity on a variety of topics uh, throughout the year. And that, so that, those are some of the highlights that have been going on there. So just some of the analysis, as I mentioned earlier, that you know, we are making significant progress in several areas. And what, what is tricky about this process is that a lot of the academic data was a year ago. The MCAS is happening right now, and we won't have that information until late summer, um, early. early fall. Um, a lot of the process data is updated, and you have a lot of the behavioral health data is more current. So there's, it's this you know, balance of trying to give the data, and the pride survey data is now over a year old. Um, and the YRBS is, is happening and is pretty much completed, but that data will be presented um, either late summer, early fall to the committee. So there's a, there's a lot of data out there. Um, but some of it is last year, some of it is current. What I also do, which I've done the last couple of years, is I've connected the agenda items of your school committee meetings to the different focus areas. In last year, I also added the standards in the rubric that they align to so that you can see that there is a strategic reason for the agenda items. A lot of them do have connections to the district improvement plan or um, the individual uh, goals um, that I presented to you this evening. So I think that's, it's pretty self-explanatory how those all align and will be aligning moving forward. Uh, now, just talking a little bit personally about the, my individual evaluation. Um, so I had essentially three leadership opportunities this year I was involved with. I am the co-chair now of the Safe and Supportive Schools Commission, which is, uh, I am the co-chair with the Associate Commissioner for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It, we had a, a meeting um, the other day, and it's really interesting to see the progress. And that, I've been on that committee now for four years. And it's been really interesting and actually fulfilling to see the work that is starting happening around the state. And we had two grantee presentations at our board meeting the other day, and both of them mentioned how they started their journey by coming to Reading and observing the work that we were doing three years ago, applied for a grant, um, and started using the tool that we used several years ago to start the process. So that was really uh, fulfilling to see that we are starting to make a difference and spreading out into other communities with the work that we've done. Um, I continue to be the chair of the Mass Professional Development Committee, uh, which we we plan the professional development activities for the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents throughout the year, uh, most notably the Summer Executive Institute. This year's theme focuses on equity and social justice, um, very similar to the theme that um, Mrs. Kelly used for the um, Spring, Institute. Spring Institute. Thank you. I was going to say fall. I was say no, it's not fall. <laughs> um, this year, I've also been advised to Desi on the revision of the superintendent's evaluation process. Next year you will see a new rubric that DESE is, is working on now. They want to make it a little bit more compact. They're eliminating the redundancy. Um, so I've been advising DESE, actually Dorothy Presser is, is part of that group with me, um, 
to revise the process and the rubric, so you will see a new rubric next year. Um, some other areas of note, we transitioned three new administrators this year. Um, we had another successful parent university. I think the candlelight vigil at RMHS was a significant milestone this year um, in determining uh, you know, the activities and direction that we were going in addressing uh, uh, hate here at the high school and in, in, in our community. Uh, the FY20 budget process uh, was a very successful process thanks to the hard work of everyone in this room. We did one administrative search, Director of Student Services, and you heard this evening that that transition is going well. Um, and we had a terrific interim Director of Student <laughs> Services this year. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sharon. Really good. And it seems like years ago, but we completed teaching negotiations in November of 2018. Um, and I have a three-year contract. And yes, so um, there was, those are some other areas of, of note. Some professional development, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the school security workshops, we were involved in several of them, um, the Mass PD Committee, and several MASS workshops and opportunities that I've been involved with. And I guess you could consider the Safe and Supportive Schools Commission professional development as well, because it, 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 it is. So moving to next year, and these are some of the things that are planned, but uh, it's not the entire list. I mean, obviously, we're still looking and in, in planning for next year. Um, literacy will still continue to be a focus. Math professional development will still continue to be a focus. Um, grade 6 through 8 social studies will be on the foref forefront. And that work is happening now, the planning piece, and uh, will be continuing next year, um, as well as differentiated instruction in mathematics. The NEASC accreditation process will continue. Late start implementation will continue. Um, the high school will be planning for social studies curriculum changes as well. Um, we'll be doing some K-12 work in collaborative problem solving, the continued capital planning, um, and we are going to be developing a new district improvement plan. And I forgot to put vision of the graduate. No, I didn't. It's on this next slide. So here are some potential areas. Again, this is all preliminary, but these are areas that are starting to bubble up and emerge as areas that we most likely would be focusing on next year. Equity and access for all students, um, physical and psychological safety for all students, the capital projects, the vision of the graduate activity, which will be happening pre-K to 12, and you also heard the technology plan piece, uh, which will be a multi-year um, project as well. So I just want to walk you through this document, and then I'll be done with my presentation piece. So this is broken up by focus area. <clears throat> the first couple of pages really is a recap of the district goal and measures of progress. Starting with page five, we start getting into some of the data. This is the school accountability data. And as you know, um, we have been at a time of change with MCAS. So um, the current data that we have, which is the um, last year's MCAS data, is the first year of the of the, the new next generation test <coughs> that aligns with this current year is also the first year of the new accountability system. So you see that in the chart on page five, you see different designations because we've had different accountability systems. And in year two, we actually didn't have an accountability system except for the high school. Um, on pages six and seven, and eight, uh, we tried to capture for you the achievement gap piece. And the way that we did it is we went to, um, and it's pretty simplistic, but we, and we felt it was the best way to do it. So what we did is we took the percent of non-high-need students that are proficient or higher, 
and we subtracted it from the percent of high need students um, that are proficient in higher. So, and that what we did is we color coded the d different categories. So, <clears throat> if the achievement gap decreased by more than five points, it's green. If it either increased or decreased by five or fewer points, it's yellow. If it increased by more than five points, it's red. Um, so the first few pages, it's looking at two different grade, uh, two different groups of students of the same grade. Um, what we did later on, and you'll see this on pages 12 and 13, is we did it by cohort, which is the same group of students over a two-year period. So that's the difference between the two, the two charts. Um, sandwiched in between is the MCAS scores for science, which is data that you've seen before from uh, Ms. Mrs. Kelly's presentation. On page 14, we captured the enrollment over the last four years <coughs> for students enrolled in the different types of courses. Obviously, with the collapsing of the level in some classes, you are going to see a shift, which is what you see primarily in year three. Um, the total number of students does not equal the enrollment because there are some students that take more than one of those classes. Um, so that's why you see higher numbers than what our enrollment is. So there may be a student, for example, on page 14 that's taking two English classes in the same year or their elective classes, which would count as two separate courses. Um, same thing with math. Again, um, you can see the shift that has happened over the years. Same with um, science um, and with social studies, which actually looks like it's made the most dramatic because they have collapsed the most levels up to this point. We also, on page 18, wanted to give you a five-year school summary of AP. So you see that data there. Pretty much we've stayed consistent um, over the last few years. We also thought it would be important to give you the SAT mean scores, um, which is on page 19. These are all, that's all high school data. <coughs> For the action plan B literacy, um, this is primarily um, MCAS data, <coughs> which you've seen before, um, except on page 28, you have the fall and winter results of the Faunus and Purnell benchmark for K to 5. Um, the spring results will not be available till later this spring. They're in the process of doing those um, over the next few weeks. You should also know that in kindergarten, we do not do um, the Faunus and Pinnell three times a year. We only do it twice a year. So that, that piece would not be available, which is why you see the winter kindergarten scores don't exist. Question, sir? Do we have the FMP data for last year to look at the fifth graders now versus when they were in fourth grade and fourth graders now versus when they're in third grade? Is that possible to get? I can see. I'll have to check. Test changed. We, we're using a different edition. Right. Too. Yeah, that's we, true. We, we have also different didn't. Um, we didn't follow the thir three times a year timeline that's recommended by Fountas and Pinnell. This is the first year of doing that. But we should have end of the year results for last year from version two. <coughs> one? Will we use an additional one? Uh, some are using one. Some are using two. And one school had three. <laughs> okay. But I'm sure we have that. And then um, the mathematics piece, uh, again, more MCAS data, which you've seen before, but we also wanted to include the math enrollment data uh, for grade eight. And then on the flip side, the uh, calculus and higher level math course data. I just want to point out and note that between 2016, 2017 class, um, there was a change in the frameworks, which resulted in a change of the algebra course. The algebra course um, for the class of 2017 was a much more rigorous algebra one course, whereas the algebra concepts 
were actually transferred down to grades six and seven in that year. So students were taking algebra type concepts in their classes um, beginning with the class of 2017 and the Algebra One course was a much more rigorous course in grade eight. Um, ironically, if you look to the next page, the shift of that resulted, or we can assume is resulting, in more students taking calculus at the other end. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice that the percent increase in the student number of students taking calculus is actually coinciding with the shift in the students taking algebra, um, the change in algebra in middle school um, in ninth grade. I also thought it would be important to list the number of students um, that are taking other high level math classes um, at the high school uh, this year, including AP Statistics, which in a lot of ways is a course that would be extremely relevant for a lot of students yeah. and is highly recommended that students take that. Um, so, so I wanted to include that data as well. And then finally, the last action plan set of data, which is uh, the social emotional learning piece. Uh, so start with attendance on page 38. Uh, you can see, and again, I just I want to clarify so everyone knows that the first three years of data are full year data. The current year is as of April 29th, um, but that you know, we're, we're, we are definitely seeing at this point a higher attendance rate um, compared to other years. We have high attendance rates to begin with, so it's very difficult to make that shift, but the, you know, what we're seeing here is very positive. A lot of work has gone in at the elementary level, especially about attendance mm -hmm. um, this, this year, and I think we're seeing that. Also, what you're seeing on this page are by cohort over the last uh, four years. Um, so if you follow the cohort, the different shaded areas, it shows how their attendance has changed over those years. Um, when you go to page 39, um, this data shows percent of students chronically absent. These are students that have 10 or more absences in a year. And you could see again, um, the first three years of full year data. The current year is as of uh, April uh, 29th. Um, so, again, you can see that at this point we have less students that are chronically absent, which is a good sign. Again, I think it points to the work that our elementary have been doing uh, in this area in, in particular. Page 40 is <coughs> suspensions and expulsions. Um, and you can see that that number has been reduced as well. Again, a big part of this is the data that we're now collecting on office discipline referrals, the positive behavioral intervention supports, known as PBIS, that is being implemented um, in the different schools. Uh, so, and this is all a result of the five-year school climate transformation grant. A lot of this work, uh, we are in the final year of that grant, uh, which is why you see some data that's five years because this is the type of data that we'll be submitting uh, to the federal government when this grant cycle is over. Um, and then the office discipline referrals. Um, you know, just a note on this, the last two years are probably the most consistent and the most accurate uh, as we were trying to become uh, more consistent in terms of what was an office discipline referral and what wasn't. Um, I'll give you a very quick example. You'll notice from 2016-17 to 2017-18 that the high school number jumped up significantly. Well, it wasn't because we had more kids that received office discipline referrals. It's because in 16-17, only two grades were recording it out of the four. Um, and that's to the consistency speak that I was referring to. Um, and again, this data for the current year is as of April 30th, 2019. And then <coughs> a couple other um, focus area D data, the tier fidelity inventory is an individual school assessment, self-assessment as to 
how they are doing with the implementation of each of the three tiers. So the staff takes a look at a tool that has a list of questions and they answer those and they receive a score based on how they're implementing each of the multi-tiered systems. And then finally, I included some pride survey results um, from a presentation that you received, um, I believe in the summer, I think that one was. So that's, that's the packet of information. And then there's a lot more information in the, the Dropbox, as, as you know. That's why we try to leave a decent amount of time Did ask, I did have um, Dorothy took a look at some of the, the, the depth and the breadth of information and said that um, that's kind of fun how that does like, provide any information to us. So it does mean that there's a lot of things to go through. So I'll oh, thank you on that. So I appreciate it. And um, if there's any questions. I just wanted to yeah, I just wanted to add a little on to what you said that um, the amount of work that went into organizing this. I remember years ago when I started and we didn't have all of this organized this way and the amount of time that it took to try to go through all of the packets and figure out what the evidence was to be specific was uh, very challenging and you've done a lot to help us give us the tools, give us a place to start, and then allow us some of our own creativity because we won't be spending our time trying to do just this collation stuff, quote, the collation stuff. So I really appreciate your help. Thank you. All right, Ms. Robinson. I just had a question, John. Yep. On the development of the new district improvement plan, we'll Will the committee be part of that in any discussions? Or? Improve it. No, I understand, but will we have input on? Uh, um, I mean, we'll, we'll do our best. I mean, we'll present it to you. Um, a lot of it's going to be happening this summer with the district leadership team yeah. um, as we do a um, debrief of this year and looking forward to next year with the things that, you know, we feel that, need to be worked on in our schools. I mean, I mentioned several of the things I saw that we've it. already identified as areas that we should be <coughs> focusing on. Okay. Did you talk about, um, after our district we're planning the meetings, if it, if it would be appropriate to have any kind of an update or just a, like just these bullet items sort of with, as you did here oh. at the, like the August, sorry, at the August meeting maybe. Like in a, yeah, we, in yes, we can do that, yes. Sorry. I was just saying that we, Dr. Darden and I can look at the agendas and see if it's appropriate to put um, an update um, similar to sort of the, the items that you listed here in the August time frame. Uh, I guess, can I continue? Yes. I get, I'm just, I guess in like in the past, maybe that was like a, re, a retreat type of discussion where we kind of brainstorm on uh, I just I don't I don't want to get into something that's not well you I don't like the term but everyone says your sandbox but if it's it, yeah, no it no seems it's a like it it's is, a legitimate yeah. question part of the challenge too is at the same time the schools are developing their school improvement plans yeah. which we want to align to the district improvement plan we don't want them going in a different direction so it's all happening at the same time I would just echo that if we could be more involved, that would be beneficial from a, my perspective and I think from some of the public's perspective as well. Um, not that we need to have it in a public session. If there is a retreat session, I, I think there are cases for something like that. They've happened in the past. Um, so if we need to find time to be involved in the brainstorming and the collaboration and the discussion, personally, I would volunteer for that. I don't know if anybody else would, but I think it's something that... Would well, it would, it would still be public. A retreat is a public yeah, session. So it would still be a public session. Whether anybody shows up. Yeah, oh, yeah I wasn't <laughs> right. suggesting that it wouldn't be public. I was just. Yeah. No, I think we're pretty much at the end. Good here. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. And 
one of the slides um, oh. you mentioned. Can you, for the record, you need Sorry. to say you are. Can you hear me? Oh, Lauren Bennett. Um, and one of the slides that you mentioned that the bridge program had developed a list of written language curriculum to be used within the program. Can I, ha can that be made public? Can I see that? Sure, as we're, as we're working on it, yeah. As those decisions are made. And is there any um, plans, I know you've mentioned Fontes and Pinnell as a screening um, process, but um, are there any plans for a research-based monitoring progress, pro uh, prog to monitor progress using research-based Tools for children who are identified as needing the bridge program services? Is or that even the context of your question? Or even before that. Mm -hmm. um, in kindergarten, but yes, the kids that are in the LLD right now, um, they default to Fontes and Pinnell, which is really not appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. um, so the Fontes and Pinnell is a way to benchmark and measure students' progress across a variety of reading skills that's used universally at the elementary level, and I think that's a very good practice for us to be doing for all children. And it, it is research-based, it's used widely. In terms of children who are identified with special education needs, um, who also have some goals related to specific aspects of reading, one of the recommendations of the program evaluation that was done by Dr. Orkin and her group was for our staff to take a look at what is appropriate progress monitoring, and that is part of what the staff have been working in their, what we call our professional learning community mm -hmm. this year, is they've looked at some tools, they've tried a couple out. Um, I do not believe there is a consensus as to what that should look like, but we are continuing to work with Dr. Orkin in identifying that. So there is acceptance that it would be a good practice to add in to what we do with our children some progress monitoring tools. Well, I, I just have a hard time understanding how we have, how we're closing the achievement gap, but we're not monitoring the, the special ed kids. We are, and I think that we are trying to identify a, some universal tools that would be used to, to help in that process. Teachers are using different tools based on different student goals at this point, so it isn't a universal one that's being used across the board. Well, maybe it's just in my personal case that my, son, my child isn't being monitored. But I, we really can't talk about individual. No, I'm students. not talking about. I'm not going to talk about him. I just want to know why. It, it, it seems like when you ask for research as a personal, this is really a my no. Better I'm as not a conversation. I'm not. I just want to know when I ask for a research based or when the L, when an LD child needs a research based monitoring for their progress. How come it's not given? We need to do that. It's not given, and it's not every three years. We get we. We have the reassessment, and that's it, other than Fontes Manel, which is really not appropriate. Um, we already that's not my understanding of what's happening for the children, so I'm certainly willing to talk with teachers and investigate that more deeply, um, that there are progress reports that are written typically every, um, court, every trimester, and the teachers use a variety of ways to measure the progress based on what those goals are. I believe the recommendation of the bridge program eval by Dr. Orkin was to examine some universal approaches um, across the board, and that work is happening. That is part of what teachers have been working on this year, not just at the middle school where the program eval was focused, but from the elementary through the high school level as well. Well, it's not happening. Okay. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you. <coughs> A motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Oh, we need to. Oh, oh, oh. Calendar. Oh, sorry. I. I told Dr. Doherty. Told me to remind you. Remind <laughs> me. Yeah, I forget, and I always feel like I want to do this up front. It's so, <coughs> what was that? It's in the back. Yeah. So I just wanted to call attention to um, the calendar. So tonight we'll complete our May 9th meeting. We have a meeting on May 30th. And it starts at 6 p.m. and that will include the teacher uh, recognition. 
Um, on June 2nd, we have graduation. Very exciting. Um, then on June 20th, we have a meeting. It's scheduled for 6 p.m. and currently the only item on the agenda really is the FY19, FY20 budget because um, we, we need to process that in that time frame. Then on June 27th, we will um, have our meeting also starting at 6 p.m. for the capital update and superintendent evaluation. And then we currently have two meetings scheduled in, in the summer, July 11th, which I know I pre-verified that date with everybody. Um, as we will have Dorothy Presser come do some MASC training with us, and we're gonna start some, um, hopefully uh, look at our school committee protocol and start some first readings as well as do our school committee reorg. Um, and someone asked about liaison roles. Usually that would be in August, maybe we would do liaison roles. Usually that's done after the reorganization, but um, with the um, next chair. So just wanted to call people's attention. Okay, now, Mr. Parks made a motion. <laughs> Second. Second. By Ms. Borowski, all those in favor? Thank you.